Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I'm thrilled that you could join us for today's event. My name is Thea Guerin. I'm an associate director at the Urban Institute, and I lead the Financial Wellbeing Data Hub, the initiative that is hosting today's event focused on public-private pr data partnerships. Before we get started, I'd like to share some brief housekeeping remarks. The event is being recorded, and a recording will be available online after the event. If you are joining us virtually, live captions are enabled on your screen, and you can adjust those settings in the bottom right-hand corner of your media player. To submit questions for folks in the room, you can use the QR code, I believe it's at your tables, uh, to submit questions throughout the discussion. And if you're joining us virtually, you can type your questions into the Q&A box on your screens. If you'd like to join the conversation online during the event, we ask that you please use the hashtag live at urban. And we'll be sharing a link to uh, the survey after an event. We ask that you share your feedback with us. Your feedback is extremely valuable as we plan and host similar lights, events like this. Uh, last but not least, all participants are indeed muted and will remain muted for the duration of the event. So with that out of the way, let's turn to today's event, which is focused on opportunities and challenges of using private data to advance the public good. Now, this is a timely conversation given uh, recent policy developments. I'm thinking specifically about CFPB's 1033 rule, which we'll talk about uh, in a few moments, as well as ongoing dis discussions about how AI and machine learning will continue to shape uh, the future of the financial services industry. It's also a timely conversation for all of us as urban as we seek to advance public-private data partnerships through the Financial Wellbeing Data Hub. So on the next slide, you'll see how we'll spend our next few hours together. In just a moment, I will welcome Sarah Rosen Wartell, president of the Urban Institute, to the stage. She'll share some brief opening remarks. She'll then pass the mic to Raj Date and Signa Mary McKernan to kick off the event with a conversation that really sets the stage for the remainder of the day. That conversation will be followed by a panel discussion featuring experts from Saver Life Urban Institute and J.P. Morgan Chase Institute, which will allow us an opportunity to dive deeper into some of the higher level themes that came up uh, during the opening discussion. And the event will then conclude with a spotlight on CDCB, an innovative financial service provider that we are partnering with through the Financial Wellbeing Data Hub. That conversation will be moderated uh, by uh, Yoli Davila from PNC Bank, who is a funder of the initiative, uh, as well as that work specifically. Last but not least, perhaps most importantly, after the event concludes, we will invite you to join us to continue these conversations at a networking reception just outside these doors for snacks and refreshments. So with that, without further ado, I am so pleased to introduce Sarah Rosen Wartell, president of the Urban Institute. I was worrying how I was going to do this, given that I'm muted. But um, <laughs> apparently, I get an exemption. Um, <laughs> so thank you very much, everyone. And it's uh, really great to see you uh, and to welcome you to today's event, and especially uh, to be excited to be able to host you as part of uh, the programming of the Financial Wellbeing Hub. Um, as uh, Thea mentioned, we launched this initiative just last year with the support of our funders uh, at the time, Intuit, Capital One Foundation, PNC Bank, BMO Bank, and Wells Fargo, with the goal of informing evidence-based solutions to advance equity and improve households' financial well-being. By bringing together data sources from different uh, locations, and that includes from uh, the private sector, and also central to this in initiative is to bring people from across the ecosystem who work on these issues in lots of different ways and those with lived experience of some of the financial challenges America's family meet. By having that whole ecosystem together, the hub contributes to a future, we like to say, where people have the financial security to provide for their children, invest in their future, and live a life of dignity. Through the hub, 
Urban has released several research studies that do this, that link data from disparate sources, both public and proprietary, to inform actionable so solutions. These studies have included studies that assess the effect of national and state level small dollar credit policies on borrowers' financial well-being, and an exploration of occupational segregation trends among black women in vulnerable work arrangements. Now, we all know that if you answer a question that is not top of mind for decision makers, that research can sit on a shelf. And similarly, if you're not engaged with people who are living through these problems, you may go off and answer a question that's not actually uh, important to their actual lives. And so what's critical about the sort of theory of change for the hub is that it regularly engages with policymakers, regulators, financial service providers, community organizations, other decision makers, and getting information from the lived experience of families together to ensure that our research is both informing and is informed by a diverse set of stakeholders across the financial well-being ecosystem. We like to say that it is, uh, that that kind of um, two-way conversation is essential if the work is to have impact. And in the coming months, the Hub will release new research, including an exploration of the financial attitudes and perceptions of Latinx consumers, an assessment of financial well-being and inclusion trends in rural communities, and an update to our influential web feature, Nine Charts on Wealth Inequality. Um, and I should say that I'm not sure if, is it still the highest grossing um, clicks uh, of any Urban ever pro Institute product ever is pretty, uh, if it's not still, it's, it's near the top. Um, it just it shows the importance of being able to distill a ton of complex information into a quick and easy accessible form, translating that research for wider audiences. Uh, we also have an evaluation of an innovative small dollar credit product that's being offered through the workplace and one of our uh, speakers at the second panel will uh, talk a little bit more about that, Nick Mitchell Bennett. Now in the coming months, the Hub is also going to facilitate um, public and private partnerships to provide researchers and decision makers with a more holistic understanding of people's financial lives. And this um, combining of data sources is an exciting next phase of this work. And it's something I would argue that is um, urban is particularly well suited to do because we have the rigorous analytic capacities, we have data infrastructure and architecture that allows us to host and manipulate and manage and protect, importantly, protect uh, uh, data, and we have deep subject matter expertise in all the different topics that play a role in financial well-being for families, including housing, healthcare, education, the safety net, and more. Now, none of this work would be possible without uh, generous, um, I would say, trust and partnership and support from our funders. So I want to just make uh, express publicly my heartfelt thanks to the initial founding funders of Intuit Capital One Foundation, PNC Bank, BMO Bank, and Wells Fargo as part of our inaugural cohort. And I also want to welcome two new supporters to this group, uh, long-standing partners of the Urban Institute on many different projects, J.P. Morgan Chase and the NE Casey Foundation. Um, and it's wonderful to have them now as part of this initiative as well. I'm grateful for them, but I am also grateful to all of the uh, advisory committee members and partners in each of these projects who also keep us connected to what is really mattering. So I want to say thank you to the Hub Steering Committee members and to all of you in the audience. Uh, and by the way, online, I greet you as well. I know we have a, a number of my friends I saw on the registration list. Hi, guys. Um, uh, really appreciate everyone being involved. Finally, I need to say a thanks to my urban colleagues who make this happen. Um, as always, the Urban Institute events team, which does it uh, with such professionalism and excellence, to the leaders of this initiative, Thea Guerin, Miranda Santillo, Nora Johnson, Judah Axelrod, and Signa Mary McKernan. And just a special shout out to Signa Mary. She's had this idea of building a mechanism for us to bring um, private sector data and public sector data together to make a difference. 
Um, many of you have been advisors along the way on this vision. We were lucky to get Thea to join us to help realize it. So really grateful for that leadership um, to both of you. And then to some of the researchers who've been already doing work um, in this context, it includes Brenna Baga, Cassandra Martincheck, Afrana Mabua, Luisa um, Gondinez Puch, um, Yi Peng Su, Madeline Brown, Brett Theodos, um, all of them are being part of this ecosystem and bringing their expertise together. Um, and finally, just a thanks to all of you who speak on our panels uh, and conversations today, including we're excited to welcome Raj Date, my old friend, and uh, Signe Mary McKernan, who leads our Center for Labor, Human Services, and Population, about to get a new name, stay tuned, um, uh, um, for uh, the first conversation. So thanks, everybody. Please. Thank you, Sarah. Um, it's an honor to serve as your moderator today for this conversation, this keynote with Raj Date. I, uh, we've known each other, I was thinking back for well over a decade. Um, it's first, strange we haven't gotten any older. I know, I know. We're just the same. We're just the same. It was um, Urban Institute advising Treasury on setting up the research unit for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. That's when we first met. And I learned a lot from you um, at that time and um, in every conversation we've had since. And so I'm really looking forward to today's conversation on using private data for public good. So I think... Um, and I was thinking, what a great day for a fireside chat. It's supposed to be spring, but it's, it's, miserable. <laughs> it's yeah. a little rainy here in Washington. So a good day for a, a chat. Um, <clears throat> you've worn many different hats over your career. And just thinking, how have those professional experiences influenced uh, you know, what your understanding of the financial services industry? Um, well, I've been lucky to have a lot of variety over the course of my career. And before I get into that, though, I want to say thank you for having me. It's like really a privilege to be here. And Sarah, like I admire very much your leadership here over the years. Um, and you are too modest in describing your role in terms of the Office of Research at the CFPB. I think it is quite accurate that without you and three other intrepid people who joined the Office of Research in the early, early days, for whom none of it was, for none of them was it really a particularly prudent decision but there would be no Office of Research. So I really appreciate your help uh, both then and, and over the years. Uh, and by the way, I know there are a lot of people um, participating virtually. I will share that here at the offices of the Urban Institute, it is, I tell you, it's some of the most exquisite modern office space that no one can find. It's, <laughs> it's great. I've never had the experience of like, no matter who you ask for directions, they, they come out sounding like my mother giving directions or something. Okay, the first thing you need to do is find a food court by the spy museum. Okay, and then, um, uh, in any event, I've, I've, um, I've been fortunate to have a bunch of different experiences around financial services over the years. And as a consequence, by accident basically, I have ended up like a generalist in an industry and at a time that has been, has seen more or less monotonic specialization. And so it's, uh, it's something that I've been able to take advantage of over the years. And by a variety of hats, I mean, I've, I've been a consultant to, lawyer for, investment banker to, executive in, regulator of, and now investor in financial services companies for coming up on 30 years, um, which seems like a long time when you string it all end to end. Um, and I've also been lucky enough to be in some institutions that are sort of super connecting nodes within the industry. So I spent a bunch of time at McKinsey, which is a giant global firm. I spent a bunch of time at Capital One, which at the time was not giant, but we had the habit at Capital One for years of basically hiring every smart person we found. And uh, irrespective of whether or not we had a job for them to do. And eventually, like these smart people go and do like other cool things in the industry. And CFPB, like I'm very proud to look at the CFPB alumni network, like a lot of really talented people doing a lot of really interesting things. And uh, if, if you aspire to have a perspective on a complicated industry in an integrative way, being able to know a heck of a lot of people, a heck of a lot of different issues from a heck of a lot of different perspectives is, is helpful. And that's, on my better days, that's, that's what I try to bring to bear. Okay. Um, and just... I think I, I think it was from you I heard that, um, you know, at the start of any conversation, clearly define the problem. Like, what is it we're trying to solve? 
And so when I think about today, uh, what are some of the core challenges in terms of collecting and analyzing data among financial service providers? Yeah, it's, um, well, I think it's useful to probably divide things into five different categories. And I think the challenge with this effort is that each one of those categories of challenges are actually pretty hard challenges, I think. Mm -hmm. So uh, from gathering data to uh, connecting data elements together to provide a little bit better synthesized and holistic picture, um, getting adequate permissioning to use data in ways that you would like to, disclosing in a meaningful way to the sources of those data that, that you know, you're going to use them in the way that you, that you want to, and then, and then finally protecting it. Um, and so all of those things are hard. So for example, in, just in terms of gathering data, one of the things we're toying around right, with right now is can we start with all these AI tools uh, available, does it make sense to start a new wealth management business? Because if you were starting one today, could you do it in a way that every advisor is gigantically more productive and therefore you can serve way more clients and you know, clients who don't have as much money? But in any case, like, um, one of the challenges is figuring out, okay, who are we gonna target? We gotta figure out who has what household wealth. That's actually not that easy to do, as it, as it turns out. Uh, just putting your hands on the right data at the right time is, is, a real, is a real struggle. And then there's the issue of connecting data together. So I had dinner with um, some bankers from a big bank, probably in the room, uh, earlier this week. And I don't get invited to a lot of dinners. And I think the reason why is I end up criticizing them. Uh, through during, and the thing I was criticizing them about is that I, I have had my personal accounts um, at this bank for a long time. And, my day job is like I invest other people's money. So it's somewhere, you know, there's a lot of money sloshing around and that lives at some bank. And this bank has never asked, never asked like whether or not they would have a chance to, you know, kind of serve our little business on the commercial side in addition to my little meager household balances. And I said, well, that's an odd thing. That's an odd way to run a bank. And they said, well, we don't have, we don't, until like two weeks ago, we never had line of sight to a true integrated perspective of any given, and that's within the bank. Uh, and what you're trying to do is, is pull off something considered more complicated. Um, permissioning, I mean, this was it just last week that the JPM TransUnion suit was announced? Um, I don't know, uh, probably a lot in this room kind of know the background here, but, and I don't know if any of this is true. This is a lawsuit, like there are allegations, but um, uh, essentially like picture being the person to JP Morgan who, who says, let me get this straight. Uh, let me try and understand what's going on here. We gave you, you know, whatever it was, Federal Reserve, OCC, we gave you uh, access to data that we own. It's our data so that you could use it for kind of good public policy aims, et cetera. And in addition to doing that, you allowed it to be chewed up, baked, and sold to my competitors. Like, is that what I'm hearing right now? And uh, I'm sure it doesn't sit, who knows if it's even true, but that's the kind of like real skepticism that people now are gonna have to overcome. It, I think it's a big deal, it kind of reminds me of the Far Side. You remember the Far Side cartoon with, uh, 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 it's Hansel and Gretel's parents coming home after an evening out and they're greeted by the wicked witch who is in their home who they have hired as a babysitter and the dad is obviously irate and he says, let me get this straight. We hired you to babysit our kids, and instead, you cooked and ate them both? I think that's basically what's, what's going on. Um, and then finally, disclosing and uh, uh, protecting uh, data are ongoing real nightmares. I mean, in terms of protection, there's really only three inevitable things. There's death, there's taxes, and there's that if you build a data-rich uh, asset online, people will still try to steal it from you. Like, that for sure is gonna happen. And it, uh, near as I can tell, is never going away. Uh, so three big, uh, sorry, five big areas. Everything for me is always three. It's very odd to have five. Uh, uh, five big areas, all of them tough, and so I'm glad that people like you are trying to tackle them. Okay, um, so that's a, a, a good summary of some of the core challenges there. And, and you mentioned um, a word I was gonna turn to next, and that is artificial intelligence. Uh, we're talking about data, and um, artificial intelligence is definitely a buzzword that is uh, being talked about right now. So when you think about some of the challenges, um, how could in the coming years, artificial intelligence, machine learning, be used to help financial service providers reach some of uh, consumers who are disadvantaged? Yeah, well, first of all, you're right that it is a buzzword and not always in the most positive way. I mean, I 
uh, one of my various um, roles is to invest in early stage companies. And so if you hold yourself out to the world as an investor in early stage companies, you see a lot of proposals from early stage companies. And I have noticed that probably more than half of all said unsolicited pitch materials somewhere allude to we're doing this through the magic of AI, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and that tends to create sort of a perception that you know, a lot of this must be smoke with no fire. But I don't think that's true in this case, uh, particularly in financial services, and in particular, some of the needs that you're talking about in terms of underserved populations. I think it really is, is today, and is likely to be a very significant shift. Um, and I say is today because, I mean, if you, if you were to divide all things artificial intelligence within financial services, or I guess more broadly, into, into two branches uh, to oversimplify, but I think, not by too much. Uh, you have sort of machine learning approaches, and then more recently in the press, the advent and use of large language models, which mostly do like different kinds of things. Um, and machine learning models in particular have been used for quite some time now in financial services. So um, I remember I was still at CFPB, and uh, the guy who used to run our underserved business at, Credit, at Capital One. Uh, had gone on to co-found a company called Zest that was, as early, this would have been 2012, 2013, were using machine learning approaches to be able to slope credit risk in a way better than typical log regression models could do. Mm -hmm. It's not that like 20 years ago we were all so stupid and just didn't know what to do. It's just that there have been gigantic improvements in data availability and processing speeds that enable computational approaches that were just not true before. So everything from Zest back then to, I mean, all of the big credit card issuers, I think, make good use of on the margin, machine learning, decisioning. Um, uh, American Express, uh, this would have been a few years ago, had announced that they pretty radically reduced the theoretical underwriting time required for small business credit decisions from like something that rhymes with a month to something that rhymes with like an hour. Like that's a big, big advance, particularly uh, uh, when you come to populations that are relatively hard to serve uh, historically. So machine learning applications very much are here. They are very much uh, uh, in deployment at scale, and that will only, I think, uh, continue. Um, the use of large language models uh, are also beginning to be seen in production. So for example, Klarna uh, had announced, I think recently, that you know, essentially a large language model uh, in few, you know, enabled chatbot basically was doing the work of like 700 frontline customer service staff, which, you know, is not great if you happen to be one of the people who is going to be, have one of those 700 jobs. By contrast, it means like the wait times for getting customer service end up being a lot lower than they otherwise would be and allow you to serve customers that otherwise would be uneconomic to serve. Um, there's also sort of the notion of um, being able to you know, th th go back to this wealth management idea. Um, if you wanted to serve well people with whatever, half a million to $5 million of investable assets as opposed to 25 to 50, you've got to figure out a way to get rid of the work that a machine can do so that like really good advisors can serve five or 10 times as many clients as they otherwise would be able to. And I think that that's going to be real. Um, uh, and then finally, like when you think about just underserved populations in general, one of the features of underserved populations, especially in the U.S., is that they are quite systematically not in the traditional data sets to the same depth that you or I would be. And as a consequence, it, it becomes a little bit difficult to get started because you can't really have a rich credit history until you have credit mm -hmm. in a traditional sense. Um, machine learning approaches because it computationally allows you to be able to consider a much wider number of variables, you can include a bunch of stuff that isn't going to necessarily show up at Experian and the traditional kind of uh, bureau. And that, I think that's going to have a real benefit. Um, it's not all like just sunshine and roses, though. I mean, like, we should bear in mind uh, things that have always been true about the use of data are true still today. So, so for example, uh, you, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, we, we've got, uh, I know well, a company that uh, is very sophisticated at using artificial intelligence to inform credit decisions. Very sophisticated. And then when inflation really started ticking up, they got crushed. 
wasn't part of the model. Not part of the data set. <clears throat> By the way, as uh, you know, the, it, it occurs to me that um, like the CEO of Silicon Valley Bank probably is a year or two older than me. And the last time we had a giant increase in interest rates, like I was like nine years old. So, so it's like there's a generational impact to a lot, of, a lot of what we're seeing, including the fact that the impact of hyperinflation simply is not in the data sets that are, that are being used to be able to make decisions. That, that really impacted like people with very low incomes, much more so than, than prime customers. So garbage in, garbage out, garbage out still is a thing. Um, uh, second, um, it's important to remember that you can't outsmart adverse selection. Now, the good, good news is you also can't outdumb positive selection. But like, uh, I'll give you an example of this. Think back to before the financial crisis. Um, there was a surprisingly big business in the residential mortgage uh, sector for so-called prime stated income loans. So this is a borrower with a prime credit score. This is walking around with a 760 FICO. Uh, who is willing to pay you 50 basis points running, so 0.5% more in interest rate a year on a 30-year loan for the privilege of not sending you a W-2. There's something about that person you don't know, and that's adverse selection. And you can have all the most clever models in the world, and you're not going to pick it up. Um, and so you know, practitioners in this space have got to remember that. Um, and then finally, like the notion of hidden bias is real. Like as it turns out, I know Melissa Coide and others have done some good, good work in kind of thinking about what are, the, what are the levers that one might use both to ascertain whether or not there is hidden bias, but then how do you unhide it and what do you do about it as a consequence? So um, I am very enthusiastic about the prospects, um, but I am, you know, uh, aware of, of this handful of, of real problems that we've got to grapple with. Yeah, okay, that's, um, that's uh, uh, both promising and then also some good warnings there. Uh, so when you laid out some of those um, earlier core, channel, uh, core challenges, I think, oh, there's things that business leaders can do to solve some of them. Uh, there's probably also things that policy and regulation can do to solve some of them. And, and we're in Washington, D.C. So uh, my next question is uh, just thinking about what are some policy developments that might help some of those data challenges and then enable financial service pri providers to better um, serve underserved consumers? Um, yeah, well, I, I tend to start... Um, from the proposition that people, you know, people are complicated and you can't really predict what they're going to do from moment to moment. But if you were going to try to predict what they're going to do moment to moment, I would start with people basically do what they're paid to do. So I think it's useful to get back to just incentives yeah. in the marketplace. And one of the many frustrations, right, that, in fact, I, I might even argue all of the frustrations that lots of people have with, uh, for example, the, the credit bureaus stem from the fact that like, at the end of the day, like, they, you are mostly not their customer. Like, you're not the one who pays them. And, and you can create all kinds of guardrails, and we do. Right? We have an entire regulatory <laughs> architecture around the, uh, the, around the uh, holding and provision, you know, the furnishing of, of data, and then packaging it and selling it back. The, it's not like the Wild West. But the reason I think why there's persistent problems is just that the numbers, the incentives don't really line up. Um, I am intrigued about what the potential downstream impacts might be, therefore, from something like the CFPB's uh, Section 1033 rulemaking. And for the uninitiated, lucky bastards, uh, for, the, for the uninitiated, I mean, that essentially is a, a, would create kind of a regulatory framework that would cause banks and some non-bank entities to, to provide on a permission basis your, a consumer's uh, transaction data, for example, in a checking account to third parties. Um, so what is the way, I mean, it is your data, I mean, the, the, basically, it's your, it's your data, it quite obviously has value, maybe you should decide whether or not you want to share it and also find a way to get value from it, like that would be, and that sort of enables a lot, potentially, uh, quite a few ways in which market participants can get their hands on data that otherwise was not that easy to get their hands on. 
in a way that doesn't put consumers at peril by virtue of the security of that data, hopefully, uh, and then create value-added ways to use that data in a way that might, I, I mean, I wouldn't bet anytime soon that, that like the notion of a credit bureau as, as traditionally understood is somehow going to get displaced, but I think it creates another vector of competition and creativity and innovation that, that right now mostly doesn't really exist, and I think that's a very good and promising thing. So some, some promising things coming from that in the future yeah, I think that so. might help us um, with underserved yeah. consumers. And, and by the way, like I, it is useful to, to recall that there's a reason why people use, for example, FICO scores. Because they work. Like in general, they do, in fact, quite dramatically slope risk. By the way, like FICO is such a gigantically like pervasive, important part of the firmament of consumer finance that when I left... And I don't know if you remember this, David, but when I, you know, my last year probably at CFPB, somebody gave me some research on FICO, and I thought, like, FICO is only like a $2 billion market cap company. Like, how can that? I assumed it was a typo. And I thought, that's your McKinsey background. Yes, I thought, like, this, that's ridiculous. <laughs> how could that possibly be? And then, because I'm not commercially minded, I just forgot about that, I guess. And today it's worth like $35 billion. So there you have it. Don't invest <laughs> with me, is the bottom line. Um, so just one last question, uh, and then we're going to turn to the audience questions that are coming in on my magic iPad here. Um, and that is just thinking about what role Urban Institute could play in facilitating uh, public and private data partnerships. Uh, well, look, I think you are starting from a very good position uh, in that you know the institution is known, its reputation is as a trusted, third-party, independent arbiter that has both the intention and the demonstrated track record of working with both policymakers and with the private sector to good aims. Um, and that is the kind of thing that gets created over decades and decades and can be ruined in months. And so uh, I'm sure that you will carefully steward that legacy. Um, I would, the, the other thing I do is I point to both a, um, an example of something gone, that seems to have gone quite wrong and something that seems to have gone quite right. And both of them weirdly involve JP Morgan. So the quite wrong is the example, again, I don't know if it's true, but the allegations vis-a-vis -vis the use of the Argus data uh, is uh, like genuinely eyebrow raising and should be a cautionary tale for anyone who seeks to pull together private data for public policy goals. Like, you cannot allow something like that, even the hint of it, to, to, to happen. Um, and on the, on the positive side of the ledger, I remember when Deanna Farrell, I think it's probably on the board here. So I had lunch with Deanna. This is, I don't know, 2013, 2014. And she is maybe leaving McKinsey to go start the, whatever it's called, J.P. Morgan Chase Institute. Institute. And she's describing sort of the, the concept, and to me it sounded like, you know, like this is somehow pulling data together from various parts of JP Morgan, and, and I left that lunch thinking, that is a really smart lady, and that is going to be a total failure. Uh, because <laughs> from my point of view, like, like what? Like, you know, the dirty little secret about big banks is that they're the aggregation of lots and lots and lots of little banks. So JP Morgan Chase, in my mind at the time, I was thinking, well, okay, well, JPM is actually JP Morgan, and it's Chase, and National Bank of Detroit, and First Chicago, and Chemical Bank, and Manufacturers Hanover, and like all of these banks are now that one thing. And gosh, who knows what kind of mess there must be internally. That's never going to work. But I don't know. Seems to work, or at least generate insights that otherwise are not very easily replicable uh, using any other source that I'm aware of. And so. Whatever magic she did there, I feel like we can probably learn from. Because although, you know, I suppose it's easier to pull together a bunch of data sources within a single institution, I don't think it's that much easier um, than doing so from a bunch of different institutions altogether. And so that gives me some confidence that it can, in fact, be done, and that you and Thea and others will do it. Yeah, um, Deanna has been a terrific advisor and a board member at the Urban Institute. I can see Sarah over there nodding. So she's a, a good role model. Uh, so just want to invite the audience to um, send questions using your QR code here in the room or putting in the Q&A chat online. And just turning to some of those questions. 
so CFB, CFPB talked about launching a, regular, a regulator sandbox at one point. Um, whatever happened to that, and should it be brought back? Um, well, I don't know. Uh, there have been lots of little uh, attempts at things called sandbox very, variously across the regulatory agencies, both here as well as in other jurisdictions, and mostly they don't work. Um, but I think it's important to keep trying. And the reason I say it's important to keep trying is that I think regulatory agencies tend to, for very legitimate reasons, tend to take on the incumbency bias of that the same incumbency bias that like their regulated charges have. And by that I mean this, like CFPB or any other regulatory agency, you know, your main resource is the people there. And those people, um, some are very, very good, but there are only so many of them and you can't do everything. And so the very natural response is, okay, well, I'm gonna take some of my best people and have them work on some pie in the sky, you know, kind of cutting edge technology, new product, or should I have them work on the dumpster fire that is student loan servicing, right? Like, what, like you should probably do the latter. But if you let that go on um, unchecked, I do believe that you will end up surprised by every development in the market. And you will always be playing catch up, and that's no place to be. Um, uh, so I don't know exactly what the fate of this particular sandbox uh, was, but I think that the, to the extent that the notion of a sandbox is to create a relatively low risk perimetered way to try new stuff, I think that should be on the agenda of every senior leadership team of any regulatory agency. It's not gonna be most of what you do, but somebody good has gotta be focused on that. Yeah, so more than just putting out the fires, but also making sure that we're going forward. Yeah. Yeah, and fixing, okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, are there any fintechs uh, or financial service providers uh, that are using AI that you're particularly excited about? Yeah, well, I, I mentioned a few earlier that are focused on things like fraud and uh, low income credit decisioning. Um, here's a couple other that I will just shamelessly talk about our own book. So for example, we're investors in a company called Imperative Execution. So if you, if you, let's say you're whatever, Fidelity or Vanguard, and you're buying a whole lot of Apple stock, because that is your business, um, and you think that the, you know, that the ask is, whatever the number is, $100 a share, you're buying so much of it that chances are by the end of your executing your trade, it's not at 100 anymore, it's clearing it's at 100.25, which if you put enough zeros uh, after the number of shares, it really matters. Um, and so what this company is doing is using AI approaches to dynamically change the crossing window for trades such that it meaningfully reduces the amount of adverse selection and slippage, which translates into a ton of money for typically long only institutional investors, which probably everybody in this room one way or another is exposed to. Like it's, that's great, because otherwise that's just dead weight loss in the market, like why would you want that to happen? And that is not something that a person can do, right? These decisions on dynamically changing kind of crossing windows have to happen on a scale measured in milliseconds to microseconds. Uh, you've got to be able to build basically an AI approach to that, and it seems to work. By the way, in my line of work, there are some things that are sufficiently technical that it really is a leap of faith when you write the check, because you, you, like, yeah. like I, I don't know, maybe, I hope it works. Like, these seem like credible people, seems like a real problem. Uh, but I'm happy to say this is one of those examples where, yeah, just seems to do as advertised. So I'm super excited about things like that. Yeah, excellent, okay. Um, more questions here, too. Uh, with your experience, which questions should researchers be thinking about these days? Specifically, that can be answered with private data. Yeah, I would go back to some of the things that we have treated, um, we've sort of treated as unsolvable in the past, and like just revisit and say, well, is it really? So, so for example, um, I would like I would like to know. So, so the thing about the student lending business, um, we have, in my opinion, an education finance uh, approach to education finance in the U.S. that is obviously disastrous, like normal, like everything else in life gets cheaper like and better at the same time, and higher education somehow, like the cost of it is like 2x inflation for decades on, like that's a disaster, and it absolutely is linked to the way that we finance all of the stuff. You can believe that, which I do, and simultaneously believe that, well, for any given person, if he or she is confident they're gonna graduate from a four-year degree program, they should do it. 
Um, but like unpacking, like where, Whereas if you're not going to graduate and you borrow money to do it, it's a disaster. And so, but unpacking like where are the forks in the road where the actual outcomes for people end up looking considerably better or considerably worse? Are we thinking about those in the right way? Is there something we can be doing differently to stage gate kind of financing decisions and the like? I think that that kind of analysis, we probably, with the right combination of data and computational approaches and analytical uh, approaches, we can probably take another crack at. Um, and I, because I certainly don't think that we have the answer today. Yeah. And are you thinking um, once in the four year, how to get through, or are you thinking about earlier? Before, Even earlier. Earlier before we get there. Even how earlier. You, yeah. Um, uh, because like the, I, I, I think it is possible that if we had a better sense of where kind of the, the branches of outcomes uh, end up and what the nodes are and how they change, that people can start making decisions earlier about how to better their odds of things. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I have not seen people thinking about this in that way. Yeah, yeah. Or, uh, here at Urban Institute, we think a lot about apprenticeship, too. Mm -hmm. That the four-year college isn't, isn't right for everyone, and there's other good options. Yep. Okay, um, just uh, want to remind the audience to send them questions. I've got lots of good questions here, so um, please continue to send them. And then the next is, uh, what advice might you offer to organizations like Urban who are navigating the complex motivations of private companies uh, to leverage data for public good? So if, if you want to use private data for public good, what's the advice in terms of you know, why private companies not, might not want to share that data? Yeah, I mean, there's there's plenty of reasons why people don't want to share data. Like, uh, if you read any of the bank industry's um, uh, comments with respect to the 1033 rulemaking, um, I think it's evident that, like, I, and I understand it, by the way, like, if, if it were me, I'm sure I wouldn't want to, like, share data either. Um, but it's not me, and 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 I think it is sort of a, a public good. I think, just like probably in most of the work that you do, I think that um, uh, simultaneously being able to mitigate the potential downside of things. Uh, so if things go horribly wrong, let's just make sure that that's not a cataclysmic thing, either for individual people and their data, or for individual decision makers uh, at institutions who are going to commit to working with you. So very much kind of figuring out ways up front, like do the failure mode analysis and say, like, if this is a disaster, why is it a disaster? And then solve those things mm -hmm. first. And at the same time, try to be able to, and not everyone can pull this off, but you guys are in a position where you can simultaneously bolster uh, your uh, well-earned credentials and reputation for independence, while at the same time kind of making winners out of people who are uh, sitting inside of institutions that, that frankly are sitting on top of a bunch of latent data that could be valuable but isn't being used for public policy purposes because there's no structural way in which that can get done, absent an arbiter or an intermediary like you. Yeah, and is there something that we could give back in terms of if we get proprietary data and uh, are able to create a holistic uh, picture of people's financial health, is something that would then help the, uh, the data owners who are trying to serve more underserved consumers. I think so. Like there's two there's two kinds of things in general, just out in 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 the wild. One are kind of give to get type arrangements. Like I want to synthesize something, give it back to you, and that's going to provide insight, etc. And that's 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 a thing, and and uh, that's a model that exists. The other thing, though, that I think is very valuable is that uh, even though we're talking about like really big, like real like consumer data at like big banks. It's, it's a, Big thing, yeah. but at any given institution, there's like 20 people who matter to that, and uh, it w this could become one of those important <laughs> fora for people to connect and to share non-competitive but important insights with each other. You know, one of the one of the models is um, in cybersecurity, uh, like FSISAC, which stands for something, but um, uh, it's it's essentially like a clearinghouse of cybersecurity threat data and approaches in financial services. And it mostly works. And I think part of the reason it mostly works is that it's not a regulator. Okay. And so it, like, paradoxically, I think the ease of sharing uh, and, the, and people's deeming of what is competitively privileged somehow is different with them than it would be with you know, the Fed or something. Like, I think it's, it's the same reason why I think that um, 
you know, Elizabeth Kelly just went over to Commerce to become the director of the, I think uh, they're calling it the AI Safety Institute, something, AI Safety, something. And that's kind of the approach that, as I understand it, they're, they're taking. Like, it's important that they're actually not a regulator in that way, uh, paradoxically, because it allows them to more easily promulgate standards around AI safety that, that people might endorse without quite so much kind of anxiety about where it might lead. Okay. Um, let's see, some more questions coming in from the audience. You know, please feel free to continue to send them. Let's see. Um, how can somebody be sure that private investment is used for cleaner and greener investment if somebody wants it to be so? Private investment, cleaner and greener. Um, uh, well, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what, I mean, look, uh, there, the SEC has been wrestling with some time about um, uh, about you know climate related disclosures and like you know I think the 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 problem is you need to build the entire feedback loop to you know kind of upstream decisions that might impact something um, and that to me has been sort of the missing piece so I don't know the the right answer but I know that we don't have like a clean feedback loop from disclosure of data to upstream decision making today. Yeah, and just on a related question, um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, what sorts of private organizations do you think are most ripe for data partnership opportunities with public nonprofit uh, partners? So what, what private organizations should we be looking to first? Well, I spend so much time obsessing over uh, uh, outcomes of higher education and impacts of higher education finance that I would uh, suggest uh, both the obvious kind of financial intermediaries uh, that you know, serve the vast majority of consumers in the US as well as uh, institutions of higher education themselves to try and you know, piece together, like what, how do you know somebody from a financial point of view, from the point of view of their longer term financial stability and kind of security in their lives and their ability to pass things on to the next generation um, what are the signs, what are the flags of difficulty, what can we be doing programmatically earlier and differently? Okay. Um, well, I think that, um, let's see, any, any last questions from the audience that I don't want to miss? Muted. <laughs> You're muted. No, no, but you have a QR code to scan and then and put it in. Um, so then I think that that then... Um, that concludes our time for this conversation. Uh, just thank you so much for being on an Urban Institute stage. Uh, once again, I learned a lot. I'm going to have to watch this recording to listen to make sure I digest <laughs> everything. Um, and just thank you for the well, thank you, Thank you for points. having me. It's, okay. it's a privilege. Well, thank you, uh, Signa Mary and Raj, for that fascinating conversation. I'm personally excited for this discussion because I think it'll allow us an opportunity to dig deeper into some of the themes that came up uh, during the previous conversation. Chris, give you a chance to respond which, to what I think was a backhanded compliment uh, from Raj. That's what I'm going with. Uh, and we'll give you a chance to respond uh, in just a moment. Uh, and then to have this discussion specifically focusing on how the, the more general themes that they discussed uh, show up and apply to a research contest, in a co research context, excuse me. Thrilled to have these three folks on stage because they represent companies and organizations that I really consider 
to be best in class when it comes to using proprietary data for public research purposes. So to my immediate left, we have Chris Wheat, president of the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute. Next to Chris is Elena Stern, chief data scientist at the Urban Institute. And then next to Elena is Matt Despard, vice president of research and policy at Saver Life. And so each of you has extensive experience in this space. And so I'd like to begin by asking uh, you to tell us a little bit about yourselves, your organization, and how your organizations use private data for public research purposes. Chris, why don't we start with you? Sure, thanks. Um, I'm Chris Wheat, uh, President of the Morgan Chase Institute, as you just said. Uh, I would have had a longer spiel about what the J.P. Morgan Chase Institute does, <laughs> but you just got a little bit of a preview. Um, so very high level. Uh, as described, we use uh, administrative uh, data to identify from our clients and customers to do research, public facing about the economy um, with the intent of trying to really sort of push forward the same kind of goals around sort of uh, more equitable growth um, and, and helping policymakers understand things that they otherwise wouldn't understand but for the kinds of things that we can see in our data. Um, I would say that I'm thrilled to be on this stage, especially as uh, we're continuing to sort of strengthen our partnership with Urban around this kind of work um, uh, with our partners in the foundation. Um, as two, we are also, um, we've for a while partnered with different kinds of researchers, but we've started some additional partnerships with um, some urban researchers as well, Michael Neal, um, as a way of kind of sharing data and doing this kind of work. So that's really exciting uh, to be here today around that. Uh, the kind of thing that we do, just like by way of illustration, um, a recent report that we put out probably a week and a half ago, uh, we were trying to understand um, the people who received advanced uh, child tax care, uh, uh, child tax credit payments, right? So they, uh, they got some money bef uh, earlier than they otherwise would have, and we thought that was interesting, and we looked at it before to understand how people spent that, but then presumably that's reducing the, um, the refund that they're gonna get, uh, if they were gonna get a refund at, at, at tax time, and like, hey, well, like, what does that do to, to the economy? Like that's a kind of question that we can explore with the data that we have because we have this very granular, uh, long-term view on people that, that facilitates that kind of analysis. So that's broadly the kind of thing that we do. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, perfect. Well, yes, thank you so much for having me today, and thank you all so much for being here. Um, I will also spare you the intro on what the Urban Institute does <laughs> since we're on our home turf. Um, and Sarah did such a great uh, job sort of setting the table of how Urban uses private data and the great work of the Financial Wellbeing Data Hub. I'll just mention a couple other examples to add some additional sort of context and color to how Urban uses private data. I mean, we use it sort of extensively across our research centers, and I would say there are really entire bodies of work at Urban that are enabled by having access to private data. Um, one such example, uh, led by my colleague Brenna Braga, who I see in the audience, is um, use of data from one of the major credit bureaus to understand uh, debt, and specifically sort of the spatial distribution of debt, which he explores in our Great Debt in America feature. Uh, it also looks at sort of racial disparities in debt uh, across majority white and communities of color, as well as debt holdings by young people. Um, and then sort of recently, uh, he was able to write a blog post looking at the impact of a 2023 20, uh, policy or policy that went to effect in 2023 that sort of eliminated the use of medical debt under $500 in credit records. And so the sort of timeliness of private data is so critical in sort of understanding policy impacts in much closer to real time than would be possible with just public data alone. Um, and then I'll be the second person to shout out Michael Neal on the panel today. Um, another great uh, example uh, by Michael and our colleague Rina Zhu um, is using property records data from a major provider and looking at uh, racial bias and automated valuation models. Um, and their really seminal research on that subject found that these models have significantly greater area error, excuse me, in majority black communities and you know, could serve as one of the drivers of the sort of racial housing wealth disparity. Um, and then they were able to actually incorporate additional private data sources to sort of further enhance and refine the model by incorporating private data on property conditions uh, into their models to sort of take that into account in understanding the impact of automated valuation models. Uh, so those are just two of the many, many uh, examples at Urban of how you know, really access to private data drives uh, some of our great research. Well, Thea, first of all, thank you uh, so much for, um, for having me, and uh, you know, congrats for uh, this really important initiative. I think it, it's hugely important. Um, you're happy that uh, Signa Mary's uh, visions come to uh, fruition. 
Um, and, you know, it's interesting because following your all's work uh, is, is certainly in, enhancing our own uh, vision and um, insights into what we could be doing with our, our data. Um, uh, through uh, so Save Our Life, we're a, a national nonprofit uh, technology and advocacy organization that promotes financial well-being among low uh, families and in, in individuals with low and moderate um, incomes. Uh, so we have three types of data that we, we collect for, for public research. Uh, surveys, um, interviews, and focus groups. Uh, transaction data across numerous financial institutions and payment platforms, uh, which is uh, member permissioned uh, via PLAID, and administrative data from our members' activity um, on our um, app and, and platform, which is, um, as the name implies, savings focus, but we're also beginning to move toward a vision for more holistic financial um, navigation. Now, I, I want to say just, just real quickly that all th three types of data that I, I just mentioned don't exist without our members. And so we're in a position where, where stewardship is, is extremely critical in, in how we use data and how we conduct uh, research in, in a few critical ways. Um, obvious one, of course, is data privacy um, and uh, protection. And another is uh, actually paying our members to participate in, in the research um, in, in a few different ways. Um, and then perhaps most importantly, grounding our research in the lived experiences and the priorities um, of our members. Um, and, and so we, we have you know, internal conversations where we're like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if dot, dot, dot. Like, yeah, sure it would be because we have all this data. But then we have to ground that in, um, you know, we have to ask ourselves, uh, is, is this something that members value? Is this important to their lives? And then we have the opportunity to actually, in fact, ask our members that very question. So we, we use a lot of the, the data um, for research to understand the financial challenges our members are facing, uh, particularly with respect to systemic issues. Uh, for example, last year we released uh, the downpour report, which described how our members um, have been financially impacted uh, by climate change. Using data from a survey um, and interviews with our members, and my colleague, Maya Pendleton, who is here today, led that work. Uh, by the way, two-thirds of the Saver Life Research and Policy team is in the room right now. <laughs> uh, so we're small but mighty. Um, and in the next phase of that work, uh, we we're looking to um, append the survey data uh, with transaction data um, and use zip code to merge with publicly available place-based climate data, such as FEMA disaster declarations and the Climate Vulnerability Index. So that's... A couple of examples of, of what we're doing. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for the introductions and thank you for the examples, which I do think uh, hopefully makes their work more concrete. Now, each of you in your opening remarks uh, alluded to both opportunities and challenges of using this type of data in your work. I'd love to start with a discussion of the opportunities. What do you see as being the opportunities to use private data for public research purposes? And then we'll come back and talk about the challenges. And I think I gave you all a specific order to respond to these questions in. I do not have that order in my notes. So I've, I'm going to go off script a little bit. Chris, I think we're coming to you first, though. Uh, that's, that's probably what the order was. But okay. I, I was also worried that I didn't have that order with me either. So that's fine. Um, look, I mean, I, I think the opportunity, we, a little of that came out in the discussion before. Um, uh, private, administrative, however you want to think about what the data is, but like data that is like collected without somebody necessarily um, proactively generating data to be used for research purposes, it has an opportunity to be um, so much more granular. You mentioned uh, timely. Uh, there's just questions uh, that you might not think to ask because the cost of doing the collection for any other like approach to get that kind of data is just so incredibly high. I mean, it's not a cheap exercise overall, but, but nevertheless, you, you might have access to a kind of data um, that could really, or, or, or point to the thing that you just wouldn't be able to get a good answer to a question if you asked a person the question. Mm -hmm. So there's, when you put all those things together, there's just a tremendous number of intersections where it's like, oh, but I wanted to know like what happens to 
in our case often, um, household finances at a high frequency level. You could not ask people, okay, but, but tomorrow, or yesterday, what was your, your checking accounts? Okay, what was the day before that? Well, you, you could have it be incredibly um, uh, heavyweight to, to do that kind of work. And if the phenomenon or the policy question that you're trying to get at depends on that kind of data, that's the only place you could realistically get it at a scale that would allow you to then do the, the kind of careful research on it and, and to the, the appropriate kind of estimation to be sure that you actually have a, a replicable answer. And so like a lot of what I think is exciting for us and for our team is to have access to that kind of data that sometimes comes together in that way. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Chris, I think you said so much of it so well, so I'll maybe just um, add on some of the great insights you shared. Uh, just speaking of, you said, you know, granularity of the data, and I think, you know, something that we're interested in, especially thinking about sort of using this data to drive equity and mobility is the ability to disaggregate data uh, when you have sort of greater granularity or just more data, larger sample sizes that enable sort of looking at small geography estimates or sort of subgroup analysis to really better understand sort of disparities at a finer level than is often possible with public data, uh, just given some of the sample sizes. Um, and then maybe just the one other thing I'll add to is, you know, I think all the new types of data that are sort of available for research sort of through private data. I know you can think of sort of micromobility data as an example, um, you know, sort of opens up new bodies of research and new lines of inquiry that just weren't possible without uh, having access to sort of these new types of private data. Um, and, you know, I think especially uh, sort of the timeliness, the granularity, the new types of data, you know, thinking about like the aftermath of the COVID-19 pandemic when everyone was scratching their head and thinking about, you know, how do we respond? How do we know what's happening? And I think private data really was turned to as sort of the source that could sort of meet the moments of uh, sort of providing the timeliness and granularity that was needed. Elena, when you say micromobility data, what do you, what do you mean by that? Yeah, well, I think uh, thinking about that in a few settings, but, you know, thinking about sort of like individual mobility data, looking at you know, where people are going, whether that's, you know, data from our phones or data when we're sort of mm -hmm. tapping into transit systems or using different forms of transportation. You know, I think there's a lot of conversation about what's happening to downtowns and cities. And so really being able to understand, well, what are people's travels looking like? Where are they going, you know, going to work, going to home? Um, and being able to understand that in closer to real time for, you know, community development organizations, for planners, uh, for folks trying to understand sort of the future of work and sort of urban cores, that data is really essential and can unlock a lot of really interesting insights. It's a great example. Social media data, I think, could be another potential example. Uh, perhaps uh, the little murkier uh, <laughs> upsides, downsides of using that, but absolutely, yeah. Matt? Yeah, for, for me, uh, three things. Um, again, because we're in a position where we can combine different types of data, just getting a more holistic view of what's happening in people's financial lives where we're able to essentially triangulate um, survey responses, interview responses, and, and transaction data um, is, is really helpful. Um, as my fellow panelists have mentioned, um, longitudinal reads um, of data, you know, one of the, I think, overarching challenges in this field is that often when we do a study of financial well-being, uh, we're, we're gaining a cross-sectional perspective. And, uh, you know, as, as we all know, there, there's a lot of seasonal variation in, in household finances. Um, and so longitudinal data, as well as being able to relate uh, financial well-being to macroeconomic um, events, like hyperinflation and uh, the pandemic, um, is really helpful. And then the last category, I'd say, uh, just being able to combine household-level data with community-level indicators um, to understand the interaction between what households are experiencing financially and uh, the variation in community-level um, macroeconomic, climate, other uh, conditions. And then how about challenges? And Matt, let's, uh, let's go ahead and start with you this time, if you're ready. Yeah, yeah, let me scroll down here. Uh, uh, you know, I think, uh, it, it, I'm, I'm glad this, I'm starting um, this because, you know, what I just said, a more holistic view of people's uh, financial lives, uh, yet we, we can't, we can never see the full picture. And, and I think, you know, that we, we just collectively have to um, accept that and have to be humble about what we can or we can't say in terms of when we can say something, 
you know, let's make it as meaningful as possible um, with respect to uh, public policy, private sector leverage points. You know, what, what can we change? And, and you know, who, who are the, um, and Sarah framed this really well at the beginning, you know, who are the institutional actors that are at least willing to hear the evidence um, and, and have it possibly influence their, their decision making? Um, in terms of at the operational level for, for Saver Life, we are um, a small, very small nonprofit. And a, a general challenge is for us to secure general operating support to support our, our data infrastructure. Just, just the information security alone, um, and this stuff is locked down tight, and we have to keep it that way. Um, we will cease to exist if, if we have a major you know, data event, um, because for the simple reason that we'll, we'll lose our members' trust, and, and we should in that instance. Um, but that comes at a cost. Uh, now, uh, I, I will say there, there are some exceptions uh, with funders. Um, I, I will, you know, nice little shout out for, to uh, J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation that their support makes it more possible um, to provide the, the support for data infrastructure uh, in terms of the nature of the funding. Um, so that goes a long way when we can get it, but we generally don't. We tend to get funding on a project by project basis. <laughs> And then lastly, as I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about, a um, you know, big question mark about Section 1033 rulemaking, um, what that might do to constrain our, our research activity. Do you want to say a little bit more about that now? Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> well, we can come back to you. I feel bad that I keep putting you on the spot. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's all kind of up in the air, mm -hmm. right, um, in, in terms of, of what um, the Bureau will do with respect to um, research that, that is in for the public good mm -hmm. um, you know what are the um, constraints the guardrails that may be put up uh, through the rulemaking um, and you know I think absolutely consent informed consent you know is crucial um, yeah. yet um, I'm a little concerned about uh, the need to constantly reconsent um, for for data, um, I know that would be uh, very difficult uh, for us to be able to do research. Um, but but again, that that's all very much up in the air. Um, those are, are just a couple of things we have our eyes on. And I know several folks in the room listening in are thinking about how to engage with the CFPB uh, around that rulemaking. And I know we have uh, several folks from the CFPB here as well uh, listening in as well. So um, great. How about challenges, uh, Elena or Chris, whoever's ready? Yeah, I'm happy to start. Well, I you know, come at this from a slightly different perspective of not being a data producing organization at Urban. And so I think for us, the first major challenge is just getting access to the data, finding private partners that are willing to share their data with us, um, which is you know, far from a guarantee, as came up in the you know, Q&A in our last session. Um, but even when you do find a partner who's willing to share data, the sort of data use agreement, data sharing negotiation process can be quite lengthy, really complex, um, and you know, can just take quite a lot of time to get into place. Um, or if you're in a situation uh, where data is available for purchase, sometimes those sort of purchasing costs can be prohibitive for organizations, even like the Urban Institute. Um, and then, of course, once you have the data, everything you just said, Matt, about data stewardship and data infrastructure to make sure that you can safeguard that data. Uh, appropriately, and you know, I think all those things taken together can make it prohibitive for all but the most sort of well-resourced, well-established organizations to access private data for research. So I think that's sort of a major challenge, um, you know, even for urban. And then thinking about all the organizations that you know don't have the sort of great resources that we have here uh, that position us to enter into those agreements. Um, and then you know, one other thing. I just want to highlight in terms of challenges, I think, as Raj said in the uh, last sort of panel, sort of the idea of like garbage in and garbage out. And I think as researchers, it's our you know, responsibility to do due diligence and really understand the data that we're using, understand its opportunities and also its limitations. And I think important to remember that, you know, I think as you said, Chris, the purpose of this data is not for research. And so accordingly, a lot of times the sort of data collection processes, the representativeness of the data, even the data quality isn't clearly documented or even understood. Um, and sort of the willingness of different data providers to sort of share information transparently is really variable. And so I think for researchers to sort of do that due diligence, uh, it takes a lot of sort of upfront 
uh, time and cost investment to get to know data, to clean data, to even be at the point to use it effectively in research. Um, and then if we are thinking about wanting to sort of understand those questions of representativeness and validate our results, I think that also poses you know, considerable challenges of sort of finding the appropriate data sets to do that validation. A lot of times there's not really the right public data that exists and perhaps some of the private data providers might have you know, internal more sensitive data they can use to do uh, their own validation. JP Morgan Chase Institute is a great example of uh, you know, entity that has done some really great work sort of validating their own data linkage work. Um, but again, I think there's no sort of standardization in terms of how that information on what validation has been done or sort of the results are sort of shared uh, publicly. Um, so I'd say those are maybe a, a couple of challenges that I'd highlight. Those were good challenges. <laughs> I like what they said. Uh, I'm going to try to not repeat, but I would uh, sort of on this like the intersection of representativeness and the data don't answer all the questions that you want to answer. Uh, one of the things I'm just excited about uh, about Matt and, you, and, and Save Our Life is that you link together administrative data with survey data. So, because often it is the case when you only or when you principally work with administrative data, you quickly start realizing the questions you can't answer and you're making inferences about like, I see what this person did or I see what this small business did, but like why did they do that? If only, if only I could ask them, <laughs> <laughs> right? And in our setup, um, and I think it's not uncommon for many uh, organizations that work with the kind of data that we do, it's not like self-evident that there is a, a pathway because of the way that you get the data to, to engage with the, the, the person on the other side of the data. So uh, I'm really kind of excited to see um, and, and, and we're going to work together and, like, and see if there's some places where we can do that. Um, uh, but that can be a limitation, um, and the challenge is um, trying to synthesize constructs that don't really exist in your administrative data to get at things uh, that researchers who have been working with lots of different kind of survey and other kinds of ways of getting at sort of understanding the phenomenon for a long time. You're like, well, but we need that construct. It doesn't really exist in our data, and that's actually can be a pretty material challenge. Um, it is hard to put the data together, <laughs> um, even within one part of a bank, to say nothing of like a bank that is, in fact, many banks put together. Uh, and that is, a, I think, a, a thing that you, uh, you might intuit from the outside. Um, but as you get close to it, that is not a problem that goes away. Um, uh, a, like a little bit separate from like data quality issues per se, just like, but this was produced over here. And it, I think that's the same person over here. And like, like how do you kind of work that out? Uh, we, we spend not a non-trivial amount of time. Uh, like, you've seen a question and you know you can answer, or you think you can answer. It seems logical that you can answer from, from the way the data is shaped. But actually sort of putting together the pieces is a bunch of work. And luckily, we have a bunch of smart people <laughs> who can work on that um, on our team. Um, and then it's, uh, it is great to have the large quantity of data so you can get at the granularity, but then like, uh, Processing data is not free, um, and so just like the, the cost, I mean, I um, am beyond sympathetic to sort of the fundraising cost, like that is a whole thing, and, and, um, but uh, uh, just trying to manage the data at scale, uh, uh, it can be an eye-popping budget experience. Yeah, um, absolutely. So and managing that is a, is a real thing. Chris, I want to come back and ask you a question about generating buy-in uh, within the organization. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give you time to think about that because I was okay, going off right. script a little okay, bit. I do want to talk, though, uh, about financial equity. Uh, we haven't talked that much about mm -hmm. financial equity, specifically mm -hmm. racial equity, uh, but I know it's something that you all pay a lot of attention to and have worked extensively on. Uh, and so I'd love to focus this conversation now on the equity piece. Elena, why don't we start with you on this question? Yeah, definitely. I think there are a lot of opportunities for private data to be used to drive financial equity and inclusion. Um, you know, one thing that we've talked about is the larger size of this data does allow for sort of greater disaggregation, uh, both you know, geographically, um, but also sort of within subgroups to sort of understand disparities that might exist in the data. But I think one you know, really key limitation of many, if not most private data sources, is the lack of sort of racial and ethnic identifiers on that data, sometimes because the data collectors are prohibited by law from collecting that information. Um, and so I think that is a real uh, sort of barrier to using private data uh, for you know, explicitly looking at racial equity. And so you know, Urban and many others uh, have used tools like data linkage, like imputation, uh, uh, machine learning to sort of append 
that demographic information onto the data. Um, but of course, it's you know so important to think about doing that responsibly and thoughtfully, um, and in a way that doesn't you know reinforce uh, inequities or biases uh, that might exist in the data. Um, and you know, I really appreciated what. Uh, Raj said earlier, I mean, when you're thinking about using this data for racial equity, you have to recognize that a lot of the folks you're trying to target probably aren't in this data. Um, and so, you know, we know this to be true all over the sector. Uh, you know, if you're thinking about access to credit, we know that sort of incidences of credit invisibility uh, are higher among, you know, populations of color. And so if you're trying to then use credit bureau data to understand financial well-being, you know, whose story is not being included in the data? Um, and then I think that also sort of circles back to some of the same validation concerns that I brought up earlier. If you're concerned about the representativeness of the data but aren't totally clear sort of where that representation lies, how do you then sort of guard against, you know, drawing erroneous conclusions when you don't really know uh, what the population in the data is? So I think a lot of those same issues around uh, validation around accuracy sort of come up and I think are magnified in this particular context just given the stakes and well said Chris or Matt yeah I think you know from from the outset uh, you know we, we start with households interact with um, all types of markets and uh, those interactions will convey often financial opportunity, uh, but often financial risk. And, and so um, is the distribution of financial risk and opportunity through these interactions with markets, um, is it equal? You know, is it, can we all kind of a, you know, have an equal shot at either uh, risk or opportunity? And, and we know, of course, the answer is no. And, and so you know, we want to understand you know, what are the specific uh, drivers um, of that um, insofar as what we can tell uh, through our research and, um, and and not just kind of broadly among low and moderate income households because uh, you know I know from years of doing research in this area that the LMI population if you will is incredibly heterogeneous you know there isn't a median or average LMI household um, and uh, we, we know that um, within LMI households, that uh, households of, of color um, bear a disproportionate amount of financial risk through their interactions with, with different um, markets, be it occupational segregation, um, or the, the new the term that you all just penned, occupational, help me out, really great report just came out. from Crowding? Urban. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so a whole new perspective on that. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so we know. So, so we have to again, you know, disaggregate the data to, to really understand the exposure um, to risk, and and then trace back to well, what are the drivers of the risk? Because if we understand the drivers, we might be able to do something um, about that. And then, and then, of course, there are some like duh moments, like the child, the additional child tax credit. Yeah. Um, like, did was anybody surprised in this room that um, people figured out how to Put that money to really good use, and and they were financially better off and more stable um, during that you know magical six months, right? And um, and and that's where you know it's not enough to just at the macroeconomic level to say oh you know yay child tax credit, child poverty dipped, you know to whatever it was um, historic low over ever many years, um, but then to understand well what did that really mean for for families? What were they able to do? Um, with those payments, um, and then understanding that what they did with those payments, especially for families with very, very young children, and um, to understand and extrapolate from prior research, which um, goes way back, which shows very, very clearly that material hardship in families with young children, especially children under the age of one, has an adverse effect on neurological development. And so it's not just like, oh, the, the child tax credit did these things, help people save, reduce debt, stabilize their finances. Um, but we can extrapolate from, from prior research to say, you know what, and that probably had like really dramatic positive benefits on neurological development um, among you know, infants. All that to say, um, you know, from an equity perspective, like never underestimate you know, the duh factor of like, if we just figure out ways to shore up people's finances at scale, 
um, there are a, a number of benefits that will accrue um, behind that that go beyond what we're thinking of in terms of financial well-being. I appreciate that real-world impact. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting. That there's kind of a across both of those kind of it's sort of a, a not really attention, but sort of a, a balancing of a scale. Because on the one hand, uh, I mean, you started with like some of the challenges, right? Um, uh, Again, data not generated for the purpose of answering these kind of questions often, um, typically, I would even say. Uh, it's not just that it's lack of representativeness can get you to uh, maybe like a bias or sort of like slightly wrong. Like it can flip you upside down, right? Like uh, if you're interested in understanding outcomes for um, lower income, people of color, et cetera, et cetera uh, and the data sources that you're using are ones where having sort of more wealth privilege access, it makes you more likely to be included into the data set. You can like flip upside down a result where you, um, by only studying the subset of the people that are sort of like the class that you're interested in, like be, that are also included in your data, you get this very upside down picture of the world. So you have to be like super, super mm -hmm. careful about how you do it so that you don't kind of find yourself answering a question because like the data had the right columns mm -hmm. and then you got to the wrong answer. <laughs> uh, so, like knowing what it is that you're getting at, like, is really super important. But on the other hand, uh, the processes that are generating these, like, there's there's a whole world of people trying to deliver a product and services using the same kind of data, sometimes leading to the or sort of reinforcing some of the disparities. So, to the extent that you're not trying to do um, public good oriented, uh, in support of public policy generating work. Um, being aware of the limitations of the data, doing your best as you can to, to, to mitigate them, well then you don't sort of, you don't balance the scale and then you don't get to the kind of interesting insight, important insight, um, if you are too uh, cautious about some of the, the, the limitations of the data. So yeah. that's something I feel like we face a yeah. bunch. Yeah. Did you want to jump in on no, that? No, I'm just you, agreeing, not, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yes, yeah. absolutely. We have received a few audience questions related to this topic, so I'm going to intersperse them. Uh, the first one I think we covered around uh, understanding the role of private data to understand racial equity issues, but if there's a more specific question beyond that, feel free to submit that. Second related is, should researchers use administrative data that often don't have demographic details and make estimates? Are surveys really what's required? And so I think that speaks a little bit to your imputation work. Uh, but I'd be curious for the group's thoughts on that. Yeah, I'm happy to start. And then would welcome uh, you both jumping in. I mean, perhaps unsurprisingly, I think my perspective <laughs> is that we you know, should be using tools like imputation, like data linkage, to fill in gaps in self-reported you know, demographic information, which will always be the gold standard. You know, Self-reported uh, demographic information uh, is, you know, the sort of ideal, and I think we should also be thinking about ways to expand our data coverage, you know, especially on populations maybe that are typically underrepresented in surveys. Um, so I don't think we should totally set that aside, but that also is incredibly costly and can be slower moving. So I think we sort of need to look at all the tools in our, you know, research toolkit, um, and certainly, you know, tools like imputation and linkage are tools we should absolutely be using, but with you know, the important caveat of doing so really thoughtfully. And um, I think, Chris, I'll maybe add one thought. I really appreciate what you're saying of sort of thinking about the limitations, mitigating them, and then I'll maybe add a third on is communicating yeah. uh, really clearly and transparently sort of what those limitations are when you're you know, doing analysis and using tools that are probabilistic in nature um, to sort of understand demographics of communities. So I think, you know, Basically, in short, yes, but you know, to do so really responsibly and with guardrails in place. I would love to underscore that last point because, like, as, as posed, and I'm sure this was the intent of the question, it would be like, well, if the answer to that question was no, right? Like, that would be kind of weird. Like, never use uh, that, like, like, that. That can't be the right answer because surely there's some questions that you wouldn't get answered if you didn't try to do it. And for years, people have used imperfect data to answer questions as best as they could. But that communication piece, I think, is like super critical because. You know, many people in this room produce research, and then you see it walked away and used in a certain way. And it's like if I had only done a better job theoretically <laughs> explaining sort of like well how to think about like the limitations of what this might be, and like the, the kind of caution you want to take in interpreting it, I think is really really super critical. So great, yeah. great. Yeah. So uh, I, have, I have two final questions for for this group, yeah. and then we'll turn to the other audience questions. Would encourage you all to keep submitting them. <laughs> 
Um, you know, admittedly, this conversation um, has been, we've covered some fairly abstract con concepts, excuse me. And so I'd love to hear from all of you uh, about an example in the financial services sector, could be the social services sector as well, that came about because of research that provided a more holistic or a more accurate picture of people's financial lives using proprietary data on its own or linked to other data sources. Any examples of, of promising innovations that came about because of this more holistic understanding? Matt, you're smiling. Let's go with you. Oh, well, if, if I can uh, call the innovation the child tax credit. Sure. Can we do that? Sure. Poli policy innovation? Yeah, yeah. No, but, but, but in all seriousness, like, uh, you know, it, it gave us a very clear indication that, you know, what happens when you provide a little financial slack um, mm -hmm. to households and, and, um, and but, but also, you know, the design of that intervention, that the payments for most households were automatic. Um, and they were made in advance, and they were made on a monthly basis. So it was a nice natural experiment, uh, not only in terms of, of you know, cash infusion, um, but also, I'm hoping, um, as uh, Chris and I were chatting about yesterday, um, that there may, may be an opportunity for more um, thought around advance payments mm -hmm. um, of, of, of refundable tax credits. Um, understanding what that can do um, for for households during the year, um, knowing that the research is, is pretty clear that um, you know unsecured debt rolls up in in the final months of the calendar year as a lot of families are, are then looking for the tax refund to pay back that debt back down. You know, so what what kind of um, efficiencies can we get and, and better outcomes for families with um, with advanced payments? Um, and then just categorically, I think um, leveraging cash flow data um, is hugely beneficial. What one hope I have is that there may be some way um, to leverage cash flow data um, to enable presumptive eligibility for um, public benefits, mm -hmm. um, or at least like get, you know, who gets the W-2 data, Treasury, IRS? You get them to talk to the agencies that determine public benefits eligibility and, and create a digital handshake. Um, but maybe in the meantime, some of that can be demonstrated with the use of cash flow data. I don't know. That's a pipe dream. But there's there's potential there. Absolutely. Yeah. I think so. Here. Sure. I'll weigh in very quickly and then let my colleagues in the financial services space uh, answer. But I think, you know, just the end, your very question you know, how do we get a more holistic picture of people's financial health? And I think in the discussion of sort of alternate data sources for understanding sort of credit history and credit worthiness is asking that very question and sort of recognizing the limitations in the traditional data sources that are often used for credit scoring and sort of credit worthiness determinations, and especially, you know, the populations that are underrepresented uh, in that data and sort of disproportionately harmed by those metrics and how can we bring other data to sort of get a more accurate picture and expand access to credit. I think that's right. I mean, the only thing that I can think of, you know, like a little bit um, upstream of specific sort of product interventions, um, but I think of uh, some research that was done a few years ago by colleagues uh, in the housing and finance space around just like, like what do we really understand about um, um, what's happening in people's, uh, with, with respect to their liquidity before they default on a mortgage. Um, I thought that was at least really thought provoking in terms of like, well, well, how might we change product uh, in, in housing finance in a way that's sort of informed by, by the research? Um, some of the work uh, we did in our uh, small business team to really give shape to sort of the, the financial lives of, of quite small, small businesses mm -hmm. and sort of the kind of liquidity constraints they face, I think, too, um, have at least sort of started questions about, like, well, like, how might you think about either uh, in policy supporting them or a, a credit uh, kinds of uh, tools as well, so, yeah. Is there anything that Chase has done specifically as a bank that's been in uh, answering well, I mean, I, I, It's really, I mean, our, when I started working uh, at this some time ago, it, it would not have been as obvious to me, and I think it wasn't sort of organizationally obvious uh, how much um, 
our colleagues in product at the bank would be interested in the research that we were doing. Mm -hmm. We are sort of set up to do public facing research that's sort of policy relevant. Uh, I work here in DC mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because like in most of our team was here because policy was the, was the, the product and the outcome. Um, but it turns out that we work at a very large bank where they are curious about sort of like, well, like how, how are our products influencing things? So like that conversation has been super robust. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think there's been a lot of learnings that have gone in both ways, both us learning from them about like what, what do these data actually mean, but also them learning from us about like what's happening with their products and, and in the economy. Fantastic. Yeah. Great. So mm -hmm. my final question then for you three is, is the same one that Signa Mary asked to Raj. Mm -hmm. And that's what role do you think the Urban Institute could play in facilitating these private-public data partnerships? Elena, I'm going to let you go last on this one, so okay. we'll hear from the other <laughs> two first in either order. Chris? Um, I think uh, uh, getting uh, public, private, whatever, organizations to share I'm going to tell you something you know. <laughs> Getting them to share data is hard, right? Um, and there's a lot of challenges, um, especially when the kind of data that you're talking about uh, and the, the customer or data owner's trust in the, or the institution that owns the data is part of the product, is part of the value proposition. It's incredibly hard. Um, so, of course, that's, that's true of banks, but that's true of um, treasury. That's true of like lots of like not like public organizations that produce data, that have heard as of producing data as part of their mandate, they also have you know, a long history of understanding the importance of like, protecting their privacy. So uh, solving the problem is hard, which you know, and I'm not saying anything uh, new, but to say that like demonstrating that maybe it could be done and generating a track record of you know, uh, not having to restart the clock a number of days since the major incident all the time, right? <laughs> like, uh, I think that that is really important work because it, legitimates the exercise of doing it. And so, I mean, in some sense, it's just sort of commending the, the project that you're already on. I'm saying, like, tell people about it and, and help them understand, uh, we saw this challenge and this didn't work and this is what we did to mitigate it, to help people kind of build that trust, I think could be incredibly important to institutionalizing the practice because it's, it's still really nascent and it's really, and for, for good reason, because things happen all the time um, because we're still figuring it out. So I do think just doing it explaining what the challenges are uh, with other people who are curious about like whether or not they could do it would be really, really helpful. Yeah. I think I'm last. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I know this is going to sound weird to say, but uh, don't be too nerdy about it, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it's it's self-incriminating, because I'm a data nerd. I love data. <laughs> What I mean is, you know, when we envision, like, oh, what could it mean to pull in all these different data sources and all oh, the really cool analyses we can do, that can take a life of its own. And if it's not grounded at the starting point with, mm -hmm. here are problems we're trying to solve. And not just, like, okay, we're going to pick something that's, you know, incredibly difficult to solve for and has zero political momentum or whatever, um, but to target things around which we, we feel there's a reasonable chance of movement and change were it not for some additional evidence or insights, and, and insights that can really motivate and compel action at the institutional level, and then be nerds about it. But, but settle on this question of those problems you want to solve first, and then let us nerds like do our stuff. And, and then, but then somebody's got to grab it at the back end, right? And help make sense of it, frame it, put it into the public discourse, and get change makers excited about what it means. Love it. Great. Awesome. Oh, well, yes, thank you both. I'll say the first uh, words in my notes are multilateral data sharing. So I think I really need the don't be a nerd. <laughs> no, but I, I completely agree. And I think. You know, impact as the North Star of sort of the why behind yeah. anything we do is so spot on and critical. Um, I had a couple of thoughts um, to bring it back to multilateral data sharing, but Chris, what you were saying is sharing data is so hard and there is so much friction and sort of upfront cost into just unlocking this data, not to mention, as you were saying, the infrastructural cost of securing that data and keeping yeah, yeah. it safe 
Um, and so, you know, shout out a great piece of research my colleague Judah Axelrod in the room led looking at different data sharing models that can aim to reduce that friction and sort of unlock data and, you know, expand access, but do so in a way that's secure and keeps the data safe and respects the privacy of the people who are represented in that data. And so I think models like the financial well-being data hub that aim to sort of bring data from different sources together um, and not only link them to, you know, expand the power of that data, but also really sort of streamline access to this powerful data to enable that timely, responsive research um, by sort of doing that upfront work of bringing the data together, I think is so powerful. And so, and so I'm so excited to about the work that you're doing. Um, I'll maybe highlight two other things. I think, you know, in the last question, we were talking about sort of how to use this data responsibly and thoughtfully and, you know, put up guardrails. And I think that's a really easy thing to say, but a really hard thing to do. And I think Urban has a role to play in providing guidance for the field of how to do that, you know, in practical terms. Um, and I, you know, got to work on some research a couple years ago with uh, former Urban colleague Stephen Brown in the room, uh, looking at sort of ethics and empathy and using imputation of racial equity onto data sets. And so providing that sort of practical guidance for folks who want to use those sorts of tools to append uh, racial and ethnic identifiers onto data, actually using credit bureau data as an example. And so I would love to see Urban do more of that kind of work and really provide that actionable guidance to the field uh, as you know, folks are exploring different applications and uses of private data to help them do so more thoughtfully. Um, and then sort of last thought, is you know, again striking that balance between expanding access to data, um, but also preserving privacy of folks in the data, uh, and also sort of their informed consent over how data is used, and sort of how do we navigate those trade-offs. And um, you know, Urban has a great sort of privacy research lab that's been you know really innovating and using tools from the data privacy community like synthetic data or validation servers to safely expand access to federal data. And I think there's just a huge wealth of opportunity to you know use those same methods and approaches uh, in the private sector data space. And so I think it's also something I'd love to see Urban take on. Many, many great ideas. Thank you. Thank you, you three. We're clearly in sync with our audience because uh, one of the first questions I've received is uh, around advice uh, for public interest organizations who are trying to forge these partnerships. And so I think we've, we've answered that. Uh, if you all have any other thoughts on advice, please offer them. Chris is thinking. Well, uh, I may have heard a version of this question. Like, uh, Matt mentioned uh, that it's difficult to earlier to get access to, which it which it is. Um, it's 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 like it can be either expensive and or difficult, right? Like in both those things. Um, in a kind of different context, I think I've found uh, I've talked to a lot of um, mostly relatively junior academic researchers who have posed a version of that question, mm -hmm. and uh, in those cases. Uh, maybe don't be nerdy. <laughs> no, no. There's a thing about like sort of like uh, inhabiting the, the the point of view of the producer of the data, mm. which kind of feels like that. Where it's like it's it's hard. It's harder to make the case uh, with a, uh, a a company or other organization that has data that, that you should be allowed to use their data if you can't um, empathize with how they feel about and understand their data. And like some of that kind of empathy work sometimes doesn't hit. Mm -hmm. And so that would be a kind of like I kind of get to know like what is what does this business do besides to have data that's interesting for your kind mm -hmm. of purposes um, can can make a difference I think. Makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll say empathy was the word in my head too, Chris. I'm really glad you said that. I think yeah, understanding the perspectives of the data sharing partner, both sort of the downside risk that they're concerned about, but also sort of the upside opportunities mm -hmm. and you know where sort of partnership and research can also you know, help advance the field and help them, you know, deliver financial services more effectively and, you know, more equitably as well. Yeah, um, so it's interesting to hear the question from, in, in the context of public interest organizations. Um, when, when I joined uh, Save a Life in, in January, uh, my title is, uh, has both research and policy in it. And I, I kind of had this, like, panic. Oh my gosh, I gotta like change public policies too, in addition to doing the research. And um, we realized as a small organization, we need policy partners. Mm -hmm. We need to know, particularly at the front end of projects, when we're, we're um, for example, we're looking at um, earned wage access, buy now, pay later, and, and getting excellent advice from experts like David Silverman. Um, and it's so important to, at the front end, 
kind of see where we can go with research with back-end policy hooks and opportunities. Um, we can't do that on our own. And, and so we can produce a certain amount of research, um, but we really need help um, from public interest organizations to know what are the right questions to ask um, because they have vision about where the insights can, can actually go and be used in the world. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll say um, that point that you just made, Matt, is not unique to small organizations. It's something that we at Urban think a lot about and occasionally struggle with as well. I also, yeah. David came to mind when you talked about wearing the policy <laughs> and the research hat, so <laughs> I, we were in sync there as well. Um, wonderful. I want to then go back to my buy-in question, and we have a number of questions, but I promise we will have time for all of them. Chris, I've always wondered, um, you know, to the extent that you can speak to this, how were Diana and her colleagues and others able to get buy-in for such a massive undertaking from the bank? That's a good question. Um, the probably not that helpful answer is um, it helps if you have leadership who already thinks it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. right? Like, I mean, like in some sense, that's like a little bit of the story, right? Like, uh, um, um, uh, the senior leadership of the bank had some of the vision already, and 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 of course it like co-evolved and has evolved since then, right? Um, but uh, and you, I mean, in the case is not like that hard to get to if you are a very large institution with a very long timeline. Like your interest in um, understandable policy making that is like more informed and and tethered and anchored in data, like you have an interest in that. And so like, you know, having a leadership team that can sort of see that uh, means that <laughs> you don't have to climb such a steep buying hill to, be, to begin with. So I mean, that, that's the actual answer, which makes us not, not that good at answering like the question like, well, what if, what if you're seeing leadership is like, no, I don't want to do this. Uh, uh, we have been fortunate to mostly not uh, been in that space and that makes me not that good at answering that question. No, no, I think it's great. I mean, it's, it's honest and it's truthful and it yeah. connects to Raj's point that, yeah. you know, more on, often than not, I think he said 20 people to influence, but right. you know there may actually be two or three senior might, leaders might, that, might that need to be bought into the vision. So I think yeah. that's wonderful, yeah. perfect. So let's uh, turn back, let's, let's uh, put our nerdy hats back on, and we have a number <laughs> of questions around uh, specific um, analytical uh, techniques. This one, this one may be, um, this one is, is, is relevant, and we touched upon this a little bit, but the question is, what strategies uh, I think have you all used to address the issue or have been used to address the issue of missing data on disadvantaged consumers, such as unbanked and credit invisible? Oh, that's a good question. Um, that's a really good question because we're thinking about some of that right now, mm -hmm. and uh, it is so hard. I mean, we were, we were actually, sorry, we just talked, like, who, who was I talking, what experts was I just talking to about this problem? It was, it was you, yesterday. Um, uh, You just you have to make a lot of inferences and then mm -hmm. hope that you're not like uh, in crazy town. Like, uh, if you wanted to try to understand, for instance, things about the unbanked from the perspective of a bank, like any person in this room would be like, that seems like it would be hard. Like, how would you know anything about them, right? But like, you know, like some unbanked people become banked and vice versa. Like, mm -hmm. like you can sort of see some things at the edges, um, but it's. Uh, it is it is one of the more challenging things, and like and, and a lot of the interesting questions are about like that margin of you know sort of um, being in our data, being in our institutions, and not. And so we don't want to turn away from those questions just because we don't have the perfect data to answer them. Because maybe there's something useful we can say, but yeah, uh, yeah, this it's a very live question. I, I'll just, I want to give a, a shout out to a uh, PhD student of mine, uh, Rihanna um, Herbert, um, who I hope is listening. Um, she, she came to me uh, a couple years ago and said, you know, for my dissertation, I, I think I want to understand how black women define financial well-being. And I said, do it, because we don't really know. Mm -hmm. And... The reason why I bring that up, I'm, I'm eagerly awaiting what she's going to find, how that construct of financial well-being is understood, felt, lived, uh, perceived um, by different groups of people. Um, the reason why I bring that up is, is you know, we can take these ideas like unbanked, credit invisible, and we have rational reasons to believe 
that those are adverse conditions. There, there's something bad about not having a bank account um, or being credit invisible. Um, but maybe not. Maybe the people who are unbanked or credit invisible are doing okay despite what we see as, as a risk factor. Um, and I think, you know, until we kind of normalize their experience and not necessarily see them as having a deficit and, and really make an effort through qualitative and ethnographic approaches, um, you know, Lisa Servan, I, I think, has done a great job doing this kind of um, approach, uh, Matthew Desmond. Um, I, I'd just like to see more of that so we can I interrogate some of our own assumptions um, about what some of these financial indicators mean. And, and maybe for 90% of people who are credit <laughs> invisible, it really is a bad thing. Um, but I think we need to corroborate that a bit by asking them. An incredibly valuable point. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, really excellent points. The only thing I'll add is I think also, you know, not just when you're looking at the credit invisible population, but also understanding who that population is. So when you're using data on formal credit histories, you know, understand sort of who's not being included and represented in that data set, you know, again, to sort of communicate and understand those limitations is really essential. Yeah. There's a similar question then around um, gaps in understanding of financial well-being and generating solutions that work in places with fewer transactions and trackable data such as rural and tribal markets. Thoughts there? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, um, we haven't done a ton outside of um, kind of more urban areas in particular in part, I mean, because it's the 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 premise of the question sort of gets at sort of like why we have been there. Like we were, we're most confident about what we see in the places where we think uh, you don't have like some selection questions to ask. But like, well, why why do we see this transaction happening in this place when we know kind of where footprint is? Um, and there's not like there's great other data sources uh, there. This is kind of like kind of calling back to the, the earlier question: What should you use? You know, data that you know maybe isn't representative. Uh, I would at least offer that it's not clear that the um, that no answer is better than a well caveated to borrow your I don't know if you say caveat I don't want to worry about <laughs> right? but like like clearly communicated about its limitation um, um, answer that tries to to do that and we kind of stumbled there was a piece where we were trying to and this is a, kind of like as we were doing a bunch of COVID early COVID stuff um, trying to understand. Uh, some outcomes in different parts of the state of Illinois. Uh, and we're like, well, what if we looked at this other city that we don't usually look at in defining what people actually mean when they say rural is its own thing, but like these are like smaller places that we didn't typically cover. And in trying to do that kind of work and seeing like, well, what else could you have learned about this place? You can see like how thin it gets really quickly as you get away, not even to, you know, sort of a tribal area or like a, um, a properly defined by uh, OMB standard uh, uh, rural area, but just like kind of like a low density area, um, a small town. Um, the, the data is so thin, and you talk to um, people who are doing economic development in, in those areas. I have a, uh, my roommate from freshman year in college I was talking to who runs uh, uh, a um, economic development um, sort of partner in, in his hometown. And he was like, We have no data, we don't have anything. So, like, is what you guys do representative? I don't know. Um, but maybe we would be interested to see kind of like anything that would kind of point in the direction. So it's it's a really good question because like the, the data isn't good even when it's in administrative data, but it's not obvious how bad it is relative to no data. Yeah. Maybe one thought I'll add, I see my colleague Coran Scali in the audience, and we've had a lot of great conversations about this very subject through the lens of community change recently. And I think maybe one thing that's come up in those conversations is just thinking more expansively and creatively about data sources. Um, so thinking about you know what data do you have, or what information do you have about rural and tribal communities, and how can you use that to maybe supplement data sources where you know your coverage is not as strong to really sort of tell a more yeah. holistic picture uh, about those communities. So um, yeah, I think just sort of expanding the aperture of what data you're including. Yeah, uh, tribal communities, I just asked my friend Sean Spruce. Um, and uh, Sean is an incredible guy. Uh, he has done, been working with um, 
uh, tribal communities for, for a long time around a lot of financial empowerment issues. And the way, the reason why I say that is I have no idea. And um, I, I, I don't have, you know, understanding of those communities to even begin to understand what I might want to look at in, in the data with that really kind of grounding it in well, what's important to those communities um, and talking to uh, trusted colleagues like, like Sean, who's been working with and is representative of the, those communities. Um, so another shout out, Sean's listening. Um, and, and then, you know, rural, um, you know, it's a, a different category because that's, you know, identity based on where you live. It, it doesn't um, have all the, the same dimensions. Um, you know, is, is just uh, using zip codes um, to crosswalk our data um, and use uh, USDA's uh, RUCA coding. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in the very least, to look at some differences, um, variation in data by um, urban, suburban, and uh, rural. Um, but then, you know, ideally if the data is there, it it's, has enough coverage to look at variation across all nine um, categories, which is a, a full continuum um, of, you know, basically, you know, downtown Manhattan to a really, really rural area. Place that doesn't have a name because there's no... There you go. Post office. Not even a post office. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm not sure uh, who asked that question, but I'll use it as an opportunity to uh, tease some upcoming research we have looking specifically at financial well-being and inclusion metrics from multiple, this was publicly available data sources in rural communities. So Needs whoever asked that, uh, assuming it wasn't an, an urbanite, even if it was, please stay tuned <laughs> for that research. So this next audience question I love, but I'm going to warn you it's a little bit of a toughie. So... Um, the question says, uh, reproducibility and replicability are key ways scientists can build trust in their research. Have you thought of ways to make research using private data to be replicable and reproducible? Lena has. <laughs> oh, I'm nodding because that was on my list of challenges and I didn't have time to talk to it earlier, so I'm really glad that somebody raised this question. Yeah, I think it's a great question and it's a you know, really important challenge. Um, and yeah, it's difficult. I think some of the limitations on data sharing make it, you know, really difficult to directly reproduce results. I, I think, I you know mentioned sort of data privacy tools like synthetic data or like validation servers earlier. I think some of those tools could offer promise for reproducibility of you know generating sort of synthetic versions of data that could be more easily shared and then could be used to sort of reproduce and validate results um, or sort of having yeah, sort of secure computing environments where results could be validated without a person actually having to see the raw data. So I think there are technological advances that could sort of help with that, but it's definitely a you know, really big challenge in the present. I, I really not have nothing to add because, you know, our, our data, again, it, it goes back to the data come from our members and, um, it's it's kind of bound up in in what their experience is being part of our organization. So we're less in a position where we're looking at trying to make representative um, and generalizable claims. Um, so yeah, that, that's maybe less applicable in our our context. Yeah. I mean, it's an, uh, there's like a. Uh, the quality of the insight is not very high if people don't trust that the work was done, yeah. you know, uh, well, to use a very broad brush term. And so the, the, the theory of the case on replicability is like, of course, like foundational. Um, and uh, on the other side, you have uh, working with a kind of data that carries along kind of a different like trust wrapper on it to begin with. So... I don't know exactly where that is going to go. Uh, I think uh, some of the next best kinds of things about being as transparent as you can about how did you do the thing and like like sharing as much as you can about sort of the th and, uh, lining up as best as you can with other work to validate, to benchmark all that stuff, super important. But it is not the same thing as like totally unbiased person come in and sort of 
uh, with access to the same granular data, do the same exercise, and see if you get the same thing. So like that, there's a gap there, and it's, it's that tension, I think, with the kind of data that it is. Yeah. So more, more acknowledging the question than answering it. Yeah, but, yeah. it's a good one, yeah. a tough one, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we unfortunately are nearly at time. Um, thank you all for submitting so many questions. There were more questions than we could get to on this panel, but I believe all three of you are sticking around for the networking reception afterward. So if uh, your question was not answered, please feel free to uh, ask them uh, during the conversation. I do have one last one. I think we have in four minutes. Uh, we can quickly answer this last one, and it's a good question because um, it uh, gets us thinking about moving from data analysis to actual action. Uh, and the question reads, we have a ton of data sources telling us that racial inequality exists in myriad forms. How do we avoid just gathering more and more information to generate the same findings? I'm going to open that up a little bit and say, um, not just data on uh, racial inequality exists, but data on financial well-being, financial health inequality. Um, you know, we know much, many of the problems. How do we move to action? Any, any thoughts? I know we are researchers in this room, but Matt, you talked about wearing the policy hat uh, as well. So curious for, for final thoughts on that question. Yeah, my answer is Section 501R4 <laughs> of the Internal Revenue Code. Okay, nerd. I just, <laughs> and, in all serious note, uh, that is a part of the rev, uh, Internal Revenue Code that was um, uh, amended through the Affordable Care Act, and it basically um, describes what nonprofit hospitals are compelled to do with respect to offering financial assistance mm -hmm. um, to income eligible uh, patients who can't pay their bills. Um, so we know that. It is a driver um, of medical debt, and we know that medical debt is disproportionately, and I'm pretty sure, Urban, you all have done this very research, medical debt is disproportionately um, burdening um, uh, African-American um, households. And, and so it, it, it's laid out right there. You know, if that's a, a leverage point. You know, what, what can we do um, with hospitals with respect to their their financial assistance um, programs, how to make those uh, more accessible. Um, if, if we're able to do that, that will address at least one of the drivers of medical debt that's creating these disproportionate um, financial risks for, for communities of color. Um, and, and in doing so, uh, you know, take an approach where we're also trying to address it as a pain point for the hospitals themselves. Mm -hmm. um, Moving to, from research to action, yeah. I, I mean, it is. I think it is uh, helpful to sort of build a broad corpus of research that maybe informs things that aren't necessarily policy connected. But if you start a research question with a policy or maybe product intervention in mind, mm -hmm. I think you're just much less likely to end up in a place where it's not clear what to do mm -hmm. about it. So I know we only have a few seconds, so I'll keep my answer short. Perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, completely mm -hmm. agree. I'll. I'll uh, yeah, just co-sign that. And I think also just say, too, I think, you know, what this question is also revealing at is just, yeah, this sort of agglomeration of sort of studies that are, you know, sort of reinforcing similar findings or, you know, unearthing disparities that we sort of know exist. And I think, uh, you know, as a data scientist, I love data, but I think also thinking about beyond just quantitative data, you know, where qualitative data, community voice, lived experience, where, you know, we already have the information and evidence we need. We don't need to sort of let doing one more study uh, sort of be uh, impetus to delay action on certain issues. So I think looking at data more broadly um, and then, yeah, also I think just working, you know, with a policy outcome in mind, working in partnership with community, with policymakers who can then take the research or the tools that, or the data that we produce and actually take action, bringing them into the process earlier, I think increases the likelihood of change. A wonderful segue to our final <laughs> session of the day. Thank you, you three, for, for joining us. Uh, really interesting discussion. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you all to join me in thanking these three, but I do want to introduce the panelists uh, for our next uh, session, which will feature a spotlight, well, spotlight, excuse me, a research partnership being advanced through the Financial Wellbeing Data Hub. So in just a few moments, you'll meet uh, Yoli Davila, Senior Vice President of Community Development Banking at PNC Bank, whose team has been funding the Financial Wellbeing Data Hub, the initiative overall, uh, as well as CDCB's work specifically. 
You'll also meet Nick Mitchell Bennett, CEO of CDCB, a Texas-based CDFI who has been sharing proprietary data with urban researchers to evaluate the effects of a small dollar loan being offered uh, through the workplace. I think you'll enjoy this conversation because I think the two of them will help make uh, more concrete, again, some of these more theoretical or abstract uh, concepts that we've been discussing, really put a human face to them and talk about the real world impact that they are having. So with that, please join me in thanking these panelists and welcoming our new speakers to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thea. As Thea mentioned, my name is Yoli Davila. I am the Southwest Territory Executive for Community Development Banking at PNC. In my, uh, in my role, I have the responsibility of overseeing our CRA lending and investing uh, from Texas to California. And I also have the responsibility of ensuring that our $88 billion commitment through our community benefits plan is executed at the local level. Uh, through that partnership and that plan and that commitment, uh, we, uh, also, it also includes <coughs> partnerships with organizations like the Urban Institute who are promoting economic prosperity. When Urban approached PNC about uh, this financial well-being data hub, it made sense to us. Not only would it enrich the work that they were already doing for us uh, for, around our community needs assessment, but it would also be important and of value to organizations who understand the power <laughs> of data-driven solutions, who understand that creative lending solutions are important when looking at those at the ground level. They need to be practical and accessible. Our speaker today, Nick Mitchell Bennett, knows well the importance of data-driven solutions <laughs> and creative lending products. Um, those products Nick has ensured are serving our most disenfranchised and economically excluded uh, neighbors. Nick has been the CEO of CDCB, Come Dream, Come Build, since 2008, an affordable housing nonprofit uh, which advances home ownership and financial inclusion. He's also the administrator of the Rio Grande Valley Multibank, a CDFI. That particular CDFI uh, launched the Community Loan Center program in 2011. We'll learn more about this employer-based small dollar loan program shortly. Uh, it is because of this impactful work that CDCB and the RGV Multibank is doing that PNC has been a great supporter of it for the last 10 years. Uh, we're also stockholder to the Multibank and they've done some really amazing work. All right, Nick. I promised Thea that we'd stay on script and we'd uh, oh, no, be on never. our <laughs> that yeah, we'd be on here. our best behavior. So, tell us about uh, CDCB, the mission, um, and what you all are doing to advance economic development. Sure. So, welcome everybody. This is the 100% non-nerdy part of this, <laughs> this presentation. So, um, CDCB and the Rio Grande Valley Multibank, we're headquartered in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas. Um, which is the very southern tip of Texas. So when you're watching the news at night and the part of the weather map that's cut off at the bottom, we're in that part. Um, a, right on the river, um, we are a wonderful place to live, to work, to raise kids. Um, it, this, the great thing about this, this segment here is we're both border brats. Um, we're, we're from the U.S.-Mexico border, and it's exciting to talk about the place that is so wonderful and maybe so misunderstood um, recently in, in, in our community and, and in our nation. Um, however, we're also the poorest city in the United States. The city's over 100,000. Um, and that makes work difficult. Um, and, and so being able to come up with products and programs and initiatives that can serve um, our population is really what we're doing. This year, CDCB is 50 years old. 1974, Father Armand Matthew decided to 
went out and surveyed his community in Brownsville, Texas, and realized that people needed a safe and affordable place to live more than they needed his mass schedule, quote, unquote. Um, and so from that, we were born and we become one of the largest producers of affordable housing in the state of Texas, as well as all the other things that we've grown into. Um, we're, our mission is to, to create and grow financial wellness and wealth for our community. And uh, we do that through housing, we do that through financial products, and we do that through education. Um, and, and so with that, all of the things that we do are there. And, and, and that's where we're trying to do and, and trying to create. Um, a, a great guy that I've never met, I can't wait to meet him sometime. Some of you may know Nick Tilson of Indy in, um, said of the native folks in this community, no one's coming to save us, so we're going to have to save ourselves. Um, and when I heard him say that some time ago, I didn't know if he made it up. I don't know where he got it, but I adopted it. Um, because for, for many, many years, nobody was coming to save the border where we were going to have to save ourselves. And so how can we create products um, to, to save ourselves? And that's where things like the Community Loan Center um, the Rio Grande Valley Multibank and CVCB came from. Got it. Um, I know you're working with urban uh, researchers to assess the, the impact of the small dollar loan program. Uh, you talked a little bit about why you launched it. What need is it addressing? Money. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean that's the bottom line, right? I mean, I can, well, I can't as eloquently as the, the, the guest before us talked about. My bottom line is 63% of our, our borrowers this last year were low-income um, BIPOC women. Mm. That, and, and above, you know, other than children, they're the poorest community, the poorest representative folks in our country. Um, many of the places we work, the minimum wage is still $7.25. Okay, so when, we, when people are talking about we need to give minimum wage to 15, I, I would love to get it to nine um, in, in our community. So until we do that, we need to create products that allow people to make, literally make ends meet. Yeah. Um, we did, you know, we've done $123 million in lending um, at $940 a pop um, for over, you know, 125,000 borrowers <coughs> across this country. But the bottom line is we did it because people need to make ends meet. Yeah. Bot bottom line, I don't, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It is what it is. Right. Um, and I know you have about 20 uh, franchisees across the country. What are the, the employers and the borrowers saying about this? What are some of the pros? What are some of the challenges? And how are you guys addressing There are it? no cons. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, the... Yeah, so we franchised the model. We figured we came up with something. We created an online, uh, uh, an online system called the KIN system, K-E-N-N. -N, and afterwards, you can ask me what it, <laughs> what it means. But I'll tell you, it's Kelton, Edna, Nadia, and Nick. We named it after ourselves. Um, it's, the, <laughs> it's the data software that we created, the SaaS that, that you do the application. And we figured out how we could do that in the Rio Grande Valley. Why not share this with everybody else? So we did that, and we are slowly gathering more and more nonprofits and for-profits who want to do this across the country. Um, it's, just, it's an employer-based model. Um, so the nonprofit or the for-profit in that community goes out and meets with the, with the employers, such as the county, the city, the school district, or the barbershop on the corner, didn't matter who it is, and says, we have a product that we will lend money to your employee. You just give us access to the employee, and they will repay us through payroll deduction. Um, and it's working. Um, uh, employers are excited about it, um, especially get with a mayor or a city commissioner or you know, the city manager when you get into the public institution. They love it because most public employers are low, in, are low paying um, jobs and it gives a little bit of stability there. Um, and then owners of the businesses love it. Um, one of the little pushbacks we are having are folks that are in the payroll de department. Um, you know, it's one more thing they got to do. And if, you never, and if you ever wonder who really runs a company or a small biz or a small town, it's the folks in payroll. Um, it's not the mayor. It's not the business owner. It's them. And so us making sure that we've created a product that keeps not only the borrower happy and, and doing it, but also the folks who are going to use it happy, and that would be the payroll department. Yeah. Um, and so there are, things, are, things are well. 
That's great. Um, urban researchers are obviously um, evaluating uh, the effectiveness of this, of this product. Um, they're analyzing administrative data. Uh, they're also uh, doing qualitative research uh, by interviewing the, the borrowers, the employers, um, and the loan officers. What is it that you know you anticipate learning about this uh, once that report uh, comes out in, in a few a few months? Um, you've been doing this for eleven years. Is there something that you're wanting to get out of it? I mean, aside from visibility, which is always great, but is there something else that you're wanting to get out of it? What what value are you hoping uh, to glean from the work that Urban is doing? I mean, as a as somebody who creates loan products and housing products and you know things, I, I'm always looking for how do we how do we improve this? How do we make this better for for people? Um, but then, uh, so that's that's one thing because the bottom line is is how do we get 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 money into the hands of low income people who need it? Mm -hmm. And so how do we how do we improve the product to do so? Um, and 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 then, but then on top of that, it's also hoping that we've created something that that is that that everybody can can access right i'm a big big fan of angela glover blackwell's the you know the curb cut theory and i i kind of run cdcb and the multibank in that fashion where if we can help people where that everyone says we cannot that you cannot help these people, you can't create a product, so we need to go up the income scale, and then we'll create something there. And I'm saying, no, 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 we need to start at the lower part of this, at the lower part of the income scale, and if we can create something that helps the poorest of the poor, then everybody else will be affected. So what I'm hoping to get out of, out of this, this partnership with Urban is, how do I improve to actually push this product lower down the income scale and, and to help more and more people? Um, much of what we're doing is based on, and the data that we have in this country is based on, you know, middle-aged white guys. And it all starts there. And I'm saying, no, let's look at the data for the low-income Latina woman and what she's got to offer and what she, what's important to her, and then let's create stuff. You know, I mean, Chris kind of said it to him. I make sure that we don't turn things around and look at it backwards. I'm saying, yeah, we need to turn around and look at it backwards because we have not been doing that. And I'm hoping that what Urban is able to do is to take all the data that we have because the data we have is, that was not th what we were trying to do. I, all of a sudden, somebody said to me, Nick, do you realize how much data we have here? You've done 123,000 loans for poor people across this country. Let's do something with this. Um, my first thing was like, is it protected? Um, it, once that was you know settled, it's yeah okay. Let's figure out how do we use that to actually to actually have the voice of low income people impacting products and and policy that will affect their lives, and then and and push it upstream instead of trying to push it downstream. Yeah, and you know as it was said earlier, incomplete data creates fragmented solutions that are ineffective. And that's what kind of what we've seen here. And, and the hope is that this financial well-being uh, data hub serves as that repository of, of data and information and resources so that at the local level, practitioners like Nick and other community um, organizations are able to create these uh, innovative solutions that sometimes financial institutions kind of have their, their hands tied. There's legal, there's regulatory requirements, and that's why it's so important for us to continue to support CDFIs, organizations like NICS, and all those who are uh, promoting economic inclusion and, and prosperity. Um, so I know this isn't your, your first time partnering with, with Urban. Um, how is it that these, these partnerships enhance your work, uh, the impact, and, uh, and, and just furthering your mission? I, mean, I think one of the... And whoever asked the rule question, yeah. I'll pay you later. Um, that, uh, that, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, and th that's one of the partnerships that we've had with Urban, despite their name, Urban Institute. Um, they've partnered with, with myself and other organizations that are working in rural America. 
um, to, to better find the data, um, to better categorize the data, to act, figure out how to ask the questions in, in low-income um, rural and tribal areas. Uh, because it, it, it is, I mean, I'm so glad in the panel before us that when the question was asked, everybody, nobody jumped in there and answered right away. Because I would have been like, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, you're lying. You know, um, that everybody kind of sat there and said, gosh, we don't know. I mean, I, I, my hat's off to you because, you know, the first step toward getting, getting well is admitting you have a problem. Um, and we have, we have a problem about collecting data in rural and tribal areas. And I'm, you know, I'm so excited about and have always have been with Urban because they've been um, working with, and, you know, with us and our, our, one of our organizations, the um, Partnership for Rural Transformation, who's working in the persistent poverty rural locations across the country in tribal America, in, in Appalachia, the Delta, um, you know, in the, on, the, on the border regions, and really, really looking at how do we collect this data through things like the Community Loan Center, through things like our, our, all of us who have mortgage, um, mortgage companies in those places, um, and, and figuring out how to do that. So um, hats off to, to Urban, as well as the, the, the other guests, you know, uh, Elena and Chris and Matt, um, about like, yeah, we need to, we need to improve on this. Um, and, and so it's on tape, everybody. Um, and, you know, we're going to be there to hope that we can help them do that and do that better. Yeah. Um, you know, as a representative of a financial institution, what is it that we, we can do to, to support initiatives like yours and others, um, aside from funding? I know that's an obvious, but what else? How can well, we support Sometimes it's you? not so obvious to everybody, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, it, it, I mean, the, the shining lights... On, on products like the Community Loan Center um, and saying, hey, um, look how, look, look, this is working. You know, and, and then who are these people that are, that are, that are borrowing, you know, borrowing from you? And then what is happening um, to them? And what does it mean? Um, you know, PNC came to us along with Urban and said, we want to we wanna look at the borrowers of the Community Loan Center across the country and understand who, who they are and what they're doing. And, and obviously, as somebody who, like, created this thing, my first thing is like, no, 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 I don't need you in here. I don't, I, I just want to keep doing what I'm doing. Um, but, but, you know, after thought and, you know, okay, let's look at them and let's, let's help people understand what's going on in this community by, you know, by looking at this loan product. For instance, um, we've got 49% and it's higher in some, but 49% average across our, all of our 20 franchises across the country. 49% of the borrowers are renewing their loan within 12 months. Okay? When I first saw that, the like, second or third year that we were doing this, and we started actually looking at all the data, and we had enough you know, data sets to look at, it freaked me out. It was like, oh, my gosh. The people are just coming back to us to and keep borrowing, and just keep borrowing, and keep borrowing, and they're making themselves, you know, they're getting caught up in this, and, and I thought, this is, this is awful, until I realized that they're doing that with payday loans already, mm -hmm. right, and we need to make sure that we have a moral and just product, because they're not getting paid enough right now, and so they obviously need to do this. Our clients are poor, they're not stupid, and so if you get a, pro a better product on the ground for them that they can borrow, they're going to utilize it to make things better. And so, you know, PNC has been a huge investor in the multibank. Um, they they upped their uh, purchase of stock some years ago, but that that actually that investment to us, and as well as some other of the banks who are, have invested in the multibank, have made us the, the creation of this um, of the CLC, and then being able to look at really what people are doing, such as reborrowing, um, and understanding why they're renewing their loans and. And would they do it if, you know, do we increase the loan amounts? Do we decrease the loan amounts? What are, you know, what does it mean? So one of the things is we did our own internal study where we took the CFPB's wellness survey and we asked our, uh, our borrowers about that. And we found out that, that, that our borrowers are that much, feel that much better about their financial wellness 
because they're borrowing from us than they did before they borrowed from us, even those who are reborrowing, because they knew it was like, oh, I, I'm not borrowing yet. And in, tex in Texas, the interest rate, the effective interest rate for a payday loan is 625%. So, so can you imagine if you just took out a loan that's at 18%, how much better you feel about your financial you know, situation? And so knowing that and having supporters who say, yeah, dig into that and find out what it is and find out what it means um, it, is really important. Yeah, and it was really interesting for me to see the, uh, the demographics of the borrowers um, when we were at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, uh, the, the annual uh, meeting with the franchisees, and seeing that these borrowers really are everyone from the, um, you know, administrative assistant to the head of the company. And it's because, to your point, um, it, it's, you know, it's effective, it's efficient, it's payroll-based, it comes out of their check. Um, and so it really is something that is serving uh, the community and filling a gap that otherwise isn't met um, elsewhere. So really combating those alternative um, payday lenders that are um, taking advantage of, of this population. Well, you know, you asked earlier, like, why, why, did you, why did you do this? And I said, money. Well, to, give, to, to kind of put a, so you can imagine what, what, I, well, what I have to look at every day. Within three blocks of my office, there are 26 payday lender wow. offices within three blocks. I mean, you can imagine, like, the Diamond District in Manhattan. Just a payroll district, mm -hmm. Literally. It's like three blocks of high cost payday lenders. Um, to kind of, as we, as we say on the border, kind of poke their eyes, I set up shop right there in the middle of them. I mean, you, you don't walk in our front door, it's all online, and, you know, but I just wanted to, you know, <laughs> I'll say poke their eyes. I won't say what else I want to say about them. But, um, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's that, that impact that, you know, that we're trying to, that we're trying to have and understand um, one of the one of the things that we, we look at is is continuously is um, what if we weren't there what would happen yeah no, and, thank you. and that's the, that's that's how we're how we need to look at it yeah thank you for that and, and for your insights and, and I hope you all were able to see kind of the higher level this going from theory to to practice um, this is you know CDCB and the RGB multibank um, actually putting this data to use and creating a innovative solution um, because the need is out there. Um, as always, I appreciate your, your candor. And most importantly, I just appreciate you showing up in communities where um, people are um, often systematically excluded and forgotten and ignored. So thank you for that. Um, we um, have the reception next. So I encourage you to... Um, pin Nick down. Um, he is a straight shooter, so he'll answer what uh, you ask him. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, we'll be out there. And thank you all so much for your time. Thank you so much, Yoli and Nick. That was a really inspiring way to, to end today's event. Uh, at this point, I realize that I am all that stands between you all and refreshments, so I will keep my concluding remarks short. A big thank you to our speakers who participated in today's event, to our funders who made today's event possible, and to all of you for joining us. I know that uh, coming in person to, attend, uh, to events is, uh, uh, it can be a challenge, especially these days when maybe we're still a little out of practice. So really appreciate you all joining us and, and making the effort to be here. Uh, this is the first in-person event that we have hosted as part of the Financial Wellbeing Data Hub, but it will not be the last. And so I encourage all of you to stay tuned for updates on future events, future ways to engage with us, and to stay tuned for some of the forthcoming research uh, produced through this initiative, some of which we teased today. Finally, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to us directly. We are always eager to be in dialogue with all of you, uh, to hear what you all are working on, and to explore potential partnership opportunities. 
Final reminder is that this event it, uh, was recorded and the recording will be posted on our website. So please do feel free to share the recordings uh, with others who were, uh, were unable to join us. So with that, uh, I hope you all will join us outside for the reception. Thank you all so much.